Very good morning to Professor Paul Spoonley, Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Mass University. Good morning to you. Good morning, Catherine. It's an exciting time for a demographer because Stats New Zealand's just <laughs> yes. put out some new data over yeah. where we're heading. Chris, early Christmas, yes. Over the next decade. <laughs> yes. uh, and was any of it surprising or was it following a, a reasonably familiar trajectory? Well, let's look at the, some of the overall um, uh, makeup of the of the population as it stands now and as it's set to come from this data. Uh, so, European New Zealanders or Pakeha New Zealanders uh, will grow in size, as you say, but decline as a proportion of the population. In fact, probably not too far off, being less than fifty percent of Auckland's population. How no, far off? Um, I I think that's quite quite soon. Actually, that's one of those tipping points. So they'll become what we call a majority minority. So they're still the largest group but they'll be less than 50% of the population. Do they have a mandate to... Co- no, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Precisely. That, 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 that's yes. been an interesting debate, hasn't it? It has when been you, a very when interesting when debate. When you're the biggest, but you're not the majority. No, no. And it's one yeah. of those things, Catherine, that yeah. we... It, it's sort of dawning on us how diverse we are yes. and what do we need to do? And, yeah. and I think that's an interesting discussion, which yeah. is still... We'll come to it. Yeah, we'll come, uh, to, we'll it. come to it. We'll come to it. All right, so that's what's happening with, uh, with the Pagia, uh, or the, the European Pagia population yes. in Auckland. Nationwide... Is it, is it on a similar much track? The same, much yep. the same. Much okay. the same. What is Faith Angle? Uh, and we kept saying, well, in a way, it's sort of better experienced than it is described. Um, but we wanted to, t- to take a little little effort at briefly saying a few words about what Faith Angle is before we hear from Ann Applebaum and from Eric Kaufman and talk about uh, national populism, which in, in, in many ways is sort of the framing question for, uh, for today's gathering. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming and, and uh, taking that risk, particularly um, those of you who are from here. There are friends in the room who have been a long time part of Faith Angle. There are friends in the room who are brand new. And then there are, uh, I think, all but one of you in, in Europe is actually brand new. Uh, to to this uh, time uh, together. So just a couple brief ground rules. Uh, Conversation is on the record, as we say in the the program. Uh, If you want something to be not on the record, just say it first, and we'll uh, obviously leave that out of the the film and and, uh, uh, proceed Uh, accordingly. So normally, we basically ground rules and jump right in. But again, just want to say a few things because Faith Angle is uh, new here um, about the project before we talk about national populism. In the States, um, uh, about 20 years ago, um, a wonderful predecessor, a guy named Michael Cromerty, um, sort of took this on in part because he sensed that there was a disconnect between, between journalists and religion. I think one time he took a conversation, a call from a reporter in D.C. when something was changing around gender, and uh, the reporter said, okay, you know, you're telling me all these things, uh, especially evangelicals, uh, this, this book, uh, Ephesians, or rather Galatians, Galatians, now who... What's the, who's the publisher on that? Where can I get a copy? You know, and so he was sort of thinking, this is, this is an opportunity here uh, to, uh, to, to reconnect. Uh, the idea is that, especially in the States, um, where we're something of an exception to the secularization thesis uh, trend, high religiosity, that, that there's a disconnect between elites and religion, between journalists and, 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 and mainstream uh, religion, heart of the country especially, and that, that it lurks beneath a number of the, the stories that journalists are telling. Maybe an opportunity to, to shore up some of that, that disconnect. And so uh, enter a faith angle in 1999 or so. Um, I remember a few years later, uh, David Brooks published this column about Sydney Awards. And Bill Stuntz had this article about faculty clubs and church pews and how very different they are. Uh, and how they have a lot in common, actually, but never talk with each other. And the idea was there, too, was a disconnect uh, to, be, to be shored up, so, so, so to a journalist and religion. So, you know, a few examples. When Mitt Romney ran for president, 2% or less of the country was Mormon. The idea was to get a Mormon theologian and scholar in who could describe what, what Mormonism is all about uh, and to go deep and to have sort of the, the there there, not just the glossy surface, uh, miles away from Washington in a place where people could retreat and then take home uh, some of the ideas and story. When ISIS escalated in its attacks, the idea was to take uh, insight from a Princeton uh, scholar who could talk about the, the, the deep roots and the theological roots of pieces of uh, the, the founder's uh, vision um, for ISIS, its charter, its, its, its leaders. Uh, when uh, nine African Americans were murdered in uh, Charleston, Emmanuel, Amy Church, uh, 
to bring in a, a black pastor and a scholar uh, of African American Christianity who could describe uh, the substance behind that noble and remarkable act of forgiveness that the country uh, witnessed. What's the, what's the religious there there uh, was essentially the, the idea. And so on, Trump and the prosperity gospel, uh, immigration, we've had a number of wonderful examples, many of which are cataloged in the, in the website, as will be today. So today, 276 journalists have been a part of this initiative, um, participating in these forums, and um, you know, essentially a sort of an early network emerged, uh, able to help one another and refer one another on, oh, this is a wonderful expert you might talk about uh, to help shore up some of that disconnect. Connect. It's been something of, a, a, something of an early uh, but real success, and when Mike died, uh, the, the tributes were just remarkable about uh, the accomplishment that had happened. So that's great for America, you might say. But what about Europe, um, where uh, we Americans often talk about a secular Europe as if it's one thing, and we're very eager today to sort of break that up and, and appreciate um, uniquenesses from, from country to country. What about France, where laïcité is the norm? Religion, we might say, is different here and all throughout Europe, well, as you may know, uh, friends, the Pew Research Center talk about countries with high religiosity in different European countries. And in Greece, it's 47%. In Anne's Poland, it's 37%. Uh, from there, the numbers decline and move a bit west. In Portugal, high religiosity is 32%. Italy, 24%. Ireland and Spain, 21%. And then ranging between 12 and 18%, again, of highly religious uh, uh, citizenry and adults. In Netherlands, Hungary, Norway, Austria, Finland, France, Germany, and Switzerland. And uh, the UK comes in at 11%. <clears throat> you know, so uh, religion is not identical, obviously, to the United States. Um, but it is, we, we wonder, we're curious to ask, still a factor. And are curious to know, uh, as funders often talk about, whether or not there's a project that's ripe, uh, whether or not there's a project that wants to happen that would look at uh, this religious priority um, here and in different parts of, of Europe. Um, so uh, again, um, our curiosity is to explore uh, whether or not that's the case. And we hope you'll help us with that. Uh, we'll obviously need your help to know whether it's the case or not, and uh, are very eager today to, to dive into a conversation about uh, national populism and to get going. So uh, we have with us two um, wonderful and very complimentary, I think, different experts, Anne Applebaum and Eric Kaufman. Uh, Anne is a uh, prolific journalist and a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, scholar. She's a columnist for the Washington Post um, and a prize winning historian who uh, is also a professor of practice at the London School of Economics, where she runs um, uh, at uh, SICE, rather, uh, now the project ARENA, which is a research project on disinformation and 21st century propaganda. Uh, she's a senior fellow with the Agora Center there. Um, her Pulitzer Prize winning book was uh, Gulag History. Uh, she's written Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, and Iron Curtain, The Crushing uh, of Eastern Europe. Uh, she served on the Post editorial board and uh, has written for The Economist and Spectator in the past. Uh, is also married to uh, Radislaw Skorsky, who is, was former uh, uh, foreign minister and defense minister in Poland. And Eric Kaufman, uh, who will follow, is professor and assistant dean uh, of politics at Birkenbach Project College, uh, University of London. Um, he authored most recently, and I have it just around the corner, but uh, White Shift, <laughs> um, Immigration, Populism, and the Future of White Majorities. Um, he's been researching immigration, religion, and national identity for over 20 years, authored or edited nine books. Um, give you just qu two quick titles, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? and The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America. Uh, he's editor of Nations and Nationalism. Like Anne, he's written just about Every place under the sun. It's a great honor to have you both here. And Anne, the floor is yours. I'm now even a little bit more confused by this project because I wasn't asked to talk about religion. So I assume that the religion will somehow filter its way into the conversation um, uh, later on in the morning. Um, I was asked to talk about populism. And you know, sitting here thinking about it, I decided that my main goal is to somehow take this much discussed subject beyond the usual cliches, because we've all talked a lot about populism in the last um, several years. Um, and I, I, wanna, I think I want to start by saying just a brief word about the definition of the word, because it now gets used to describe several different, sometimes overlapping, but not exactly the same things. 
Sometimes we use it to mean anti-establishment political parties or movements. But that, of course, can include um, everybody from Emmanuel Macron, who is a, you know, who was a absolutely a destroyer of the establishment system, created a new party from scratch and and used it to win power. Um, it, you know, it can get, it can it can be used to describe um, old parties that have been around for a long time that have tried to change their tone. So, um, so sometimes it means anti-establishment. Sometimes it's used to mean anti-European Union in Europe. Um, but of course, there's a very old tradition of this too. There have been anti-European parties in, in every member of the European Union from the very beginning, on the, both on the left and on the right. Um, sometimes it's used to mean anti-immigrant, which means it sounds a little bit more like the traditional far right in Europe. Um, although that's also something that we've had for a long time. Sometimes it's used to mean anti-capitalist or anti-globalization parties, which is more the realm of the traditional far left. Um, you know, depending on the country, these different sets of feelings, you know, have different weights and require, you know, and, and, and different explanations. Um, uh, I think the one, um, the one newer element um, is the, the, the piece of the, the new populism, which is actually anti-democratic in that it opposes some of the sort of traditional and, and, and fundamental, actually, institutions of liberal democracy, which can include the media, the judiciary, um, independent organizations of all kinds. Um, and sometimes we're talking about political parties what, that when they take power, um, they seek to change the rules, or they, or they would hope to change the rules in such a way that they would never lose again. And we have a couple of examples of that in Europe um, already. Um, the difficulty is that some of these so-called populist positions can be expressed very easily within current political systems. I mean, it is very legitimate to want limits on immigration, and lots of political parties have made that argument before. You know, the, the Tories in Britain have been very loudly talking about it for many years without anybody considering them to be populist um, or in any way, you know, different from the norm. You know, it's legitimate to ask whether, you know, international treaties, including the European ones, are right for your country. And there have been people asking that for a long time. Um, it's also legitimate to ask whether capitalism is working the way that it should. You know, should we have more controls on big companies? Should we have higher taxes? Um, you know, you know, we all, you know, nationaliz nationalization of industry, which is now anathema in a lot of places, was the norm, you know, in the 1950s after the war. There were, it was, it was a common thing that governments did. So, so there's not, that's not necessarily something that's new, um, you know, although it's unusual now at the moment. Um, you know, reaction to immigration could just be to restrict it, which many countries have done. Um, but, I, you know, but I think we can all agree that what we are, the, the phenomenon that is new um, is this one strand of, of what we sometimes call populism, which I would say, again, is really authoritarian, or it's, we're talking about parties which share a set of tactics which are ultimately designed to undermine um, democracy. Um, and in order to get to the heart of who they are and what it is that's appealing about them, I wanted to talk first about, not about why people vote for them exactly and who the, and what the, you know, the big trends behind the reasons of their, their, um, their political success is, but to look a little bit at who they are and where these parties come from. Um, and to name names, I'm talking about the Law and Justice Party in Poland, which is now the ruling party. I'm talking about Fidesz in Hungary. Um, I'm talking, and then after that, I'm, those are the two that are in power. And after that, I'm talking about a set of parties, some of which have come close to power or have had local power, but haven't actually, um, haven't actually won national elections. And then we're talking about the Freedom Party in Austria. We're talking about um, Marine Le Pen in France. We're talking about... Um, you know, Salvini in Italy. We're talking about parties that have a, um, um, a more than normal anti-establishment um, uh, language, um, and which ha which which appear to be or say they are challenging the status quo in very deep ways. So again, challenging the system as it exists, challenging the the nature of democracy as we know it, and then because of the c deep connection between democracy and the European Union on, on this continent, I'm not talking about Trump at the, for the for the moment. Um, to often talking about about that that system as well, um, it's important to look at who they are and who the who these leaders are. Quite a large number of them are um, are people who come from the old center right, 
Um, so they are, some of them are people who've been in politics for a long time. So I did a big project. I spent some time in Spain um, last winter uh, talking to people from Vox. Um, this is the new Spanish far right movement. Um, and the leadership of Vox is almost entirely people who were at one point part of the Spanish, the, 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 the sort of, Spain had two parties after Franco, kind of a big center left party and a big center right party. And quite most of the leaders of Vox come from the former center right. Um, just like, um, you know, in, I mean, Britain, I think is a, I want to keep it aside for the moment because I think the Brexit debate is a little bit different. But I mean, to the extent that you can compare the Brexit party and Nigel Farage to these same groups of, of um, to these other kinds of leaders, um, these are also people who come from the Tory party or were, would have called themselves Tories 10 years ago. Um, same thing in, um, you know, in Poland, there was a kind of big amorphous right, which basically broke into two groups. Um, there's now a center right and, and, a, and, and the law and justice, which is the far right, um, and so on, and you can go down the list. And so often what we're talking about is some kind of disappointment with I mean, in my view, it's often to do with disappointment with right-wing, center-right politics post-Cold War. Um, that when these parties were, you know, the leading edge of arguing for the Western alliance, arguing against communism, um, in the 90s and in the 2000s, many of them um, became, for some of their leaders, some of the intellectuals close to them, some of the journalists who write about them, and some of their, and then eventually some of the people who vote for them, began to seem too centrist, uh, too interested in economics, um, too, you know, too complacent. You know, they, they lost some of their interest and some of their, um, and some of the ideological drive that I think the Cold War gave them. And you can certainly, if you think about the US Republican Party in that context, if you think about the Tory party, um, and then if you think about a series, if you think of the CDU in Germany, if you think about a series of parties um, across Europe that, had a, um, a coherence um, you know, uh, before 1989, um, you can then see how, as they became kind of centrist parties that were hard to distinguish from the center left, how for some of their, as I said, almost particularly the intellectuals close to them, they became kind of boring. They weren't interesting projects. Um, and what some people began looking for was a, and what, and it's more to understand the, the far right parties in particular, um, not as a, you know, not just as a, um, and, and by the way, the far left too, although at, at the moment the far left doesn't have the political momentum, it may eventually get it. I mean, if Corbyn wins in Britain, um, or you can, you can imagine one or two other places, you know, you could see the same phenomenon on the left. I'm talking mostly about the right because these are parties that are in power or close to power. Um, so you see, you, know, you, you begin to see that for then for a lot of people, these parties are, a, they are a, not just, it's not, um, they're a set of political ideas that will bring a group of people to power who feel out of power. Um, and once you understand that, um, then you begin to understand why, um, how people, are, you know, why people find them attractive, why they join them. And one of the things that we saw when, when the Law and Justice Party eventually won in Poland, um, after, after being in Polish politics for 20 years, when they finally won a majority and they were able to, you know, to, to fully take over the government, the first thing they did, I mean, almost, and almost the most important thing they did was they fired almost the entire civil service, something like 10,000 people, um, and replaced the civil service with, I mean, literally their cousins. I mean, other party members, people's relatives, people's cousins, people's next door neighbors, um, and they, they almost privatized a part of the state um, and gave all those jobs to people that they know. And otherwise, this was a project designed to bring people who, had, who were politically on the sidelines into power and give them jobs. And it was literally that kind of project. And we actually see um, in a number of other instances when these kinds of parties win, they do the same to the extent that they can. Um, if you think about the Freedom Party in Austria, um, uh, you know, when when they when they are able to do so, um, you know, um, you know a lot a lot of this is about you know bringing you know br getting money and getting um, and getting influence for their members. I mean, the those most of you will know, but a few of them won't. Few you won't know that the leader of the Freedom Party, which was this is the far right party in Austria that was for a while part of the Austrian ruling coalition. Um, there is a, one of the reasons why it's, or the reason why its leader recently had to resign was that he was caught on tape talking to a woman who he thought was a Russian oligarch. 
And in fact, she was a um, she was nothing of the sort. But she was a she was a she was fake. But and somebody was taping him, and the the conversation he had with her was all about his. He had this idea that she could buy one of the Austrian newspapers, um, and that they could then take it over. And he could make it into a propaganda organ for his party. And you know, he talked about which journalists he would fire and which journalists he. He said, "Well, I have some tame journalists." I can. So, in other words, for him, for him, you know, politics is partly about getting control of propaganda organs, getting his people in place. Um, and this is one of the, you know, this is and this is an important element to each one of these parties. You also, you also can't, you know, you can't talk about Viktor Orban's Fidesz party in Hungary. Um, unless you talk about the extraordinary way in which he's used the party to earn money for himself and for his family. I mean, this is a, this is a group of people who've stolen an amazing amount of money. They've created a sort of a new political class in Hungary, um, you know, essentially uh, forcing for older businessmen to sell their properties or leave the country, pushing people out of business and replacing them with their own people. So in some cases, this is a um, you know, the, um, the, this is a this is you know this, and without that link, you don't understand what Fidesz is. Um, for some of the people, there's a special issue around these kinds of parties in Eastern Europe. I, so, for mo for the most part, I I'm really starting to dislike the idea that there's some kind of specialness to Eastern Europe that you know there's a special authoritarian something to do with communism or leftover from. Um, from the past that applies in Eastern Europe and nowhere else. Um, I think for the most part, the, the, these kinds of political parties you can find in every European country, and they're, they're the product of um, many of the same movements and, and, and ideas. Um, there is one thing in Eastern Europe that makes a lot of the leaders and intellectuals around these parties a little bit different, which is that there is an issue of almost a kind of post-colonial you know, you guys told us what to do for the last 30 years, and now we would like to decide what we want to do. There is a, um, you know, there are, you can find particular intellectuals in Hungary and Poland who, um, who talk about having been talked down to by Westerners, and now they would like to say, we don't, you know, we don't accept this anymore. We want to, you know, we want to speak for ourselves. Um, and you have that kind of and you do have that kind of attitude there. I mean, you can get a little bit of flavor of that a little bit also in Italy and Greece and some other parts of Southern Europe that are more recent, um, that are also more recent parts of the Democrat, you know, sort of members of the Democratic family as well, a kind of um, almost, you know, post-colonial reaction. I don't, we don't want to be told to do by, what, by Germany. We don't want to be told what to do by France. We're sick of being dictated to by the kind of establishment European powers, and we don't want to be lectured about democracy. So you get, so that is a, you know that's another element, and that's probably stronger in Eastern Europe than it is um, in other places. I mean, another phenomenon that is also fairly new um, is the phenomenon of these parties uh, learning to work together. So historically, you know, the French far right was born out of arguments about you know Vichy in Algeria, and the Italian far right was for a long time. It featured the intellectual descendants, I mean, literally, or real descendants of Mussolini. Um, you know, and the attempts to fraternize between these parties were often you know, laughable because, you know, every, and even now, um, there was a very amusing meeting recently between a group of the, of, you know, Salvini's party um, and the Austrian far right, and they tried to have a sort of, you know, friendly meeting somewhere in the South Tyrol. Um, and of course, the meeting came completely unstuck um, when the, um, when the Austrians started talking about this is the part of Italy that used to be um, part of Austria, or depending which which border you're looking at, and you know when the Austrians started saying, well now we're you know we're home guys, you know, and we need to reestablish Austrian power here, you know, the meeting ended rather badly. I mean, so very often the the conversations between these different groups break down in the traditional way because they. Um, you know, because they immediately start arguing over borders and you know who's in control. You know, who really should um, should run Trieste. Um, but there's a, there's another element, though. But oh, sorry, but but that has recently changed, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, they have begun to think to work together. They've found they've now found some issues that they have in common, um, and so one of the new elements of you know what makes them new and different, and why they're different from the old right is that is the ways in which they've begun to cooperate, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but the final, the, before I do that, I want to say one final thing, which is the the other thing that unites them, the new element um, that again, a night, we're talking about the people at the top, and we're talking about the people around them. 
um, is a kind of nihilism that we haven't had in politics for a long time. And it's a kind of the assumption that everything is terrible. And, and by the way, you find this on the left, too. I don't want to. And there's a different version of it on the left. Um, but the assumption that everything needs to be burned down, that the system is so rotten, you know, that it it requires a total transformation, that, you know, that the current politics as we know it don't work anymore. And can't, we can't fix the problem in the current set. You know, liberal democracy as it exists, the political party system as it exists, cannot deliver the solutions anymore. Um, and there are different versions of this in different countries, but I mean, you hear it everywhere. In Poland, the, the, the current ruling party, their first election slogan in 2015, the one that they used to win was Polska w ruinie, Poland is ruined. You know, so not just a few things are bad and we need to tinker with the monetary policy, and I, but it's ruined. And this is, by the way, in a country that was, that and is still, I mean, uh, a, you know, a standout success where you've had, um, you know, 30 years of economic growth. There hasn't been a recession since 1989. Um, you know, looking at statistically, everybody is richer than they used to be, including the, I mean, inequality is shrinking. Um, you know, investment has been going. I mean, so nevertheless, they use this slogan um, to win. Um, uh, you, you know, in, 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 there's an element of this, again, Brexit is a little bit different. There's an element of this in the Brexit debate that, you know, the only way that Britain can succeed in the future is we need to destroy all our alliances. You know, this, this is the appeal, by the way, of so-called hard Brexit. You know, we need to leave without a deal. And if there's an economic catastrophe, so what? It'll be good for us. You can, there's been a, there's been an element of the British debate which says, um, you know, we, you know, just like in the war, we need to prove once again that we can live with austerity and we can live in a, in a destroyed situation. And this is a, and there's a strand of thinking in Britain, which is also kind of apocalyptic. Let's end everything, cut all our ties, you know, change the whole system and be different. And this kind of um, nihilistic, Europe is in crisis, Poland is in ruin. Um, you know, it can't be fixed in the current way. This is also very much powers the intellectuals who are around these movements um, and, and, to, and, and some, to some extent their leaders um, as well. So not, that's a little bit of a description of who, what kinds of people we're talking about. Again, once for like the fourth time, I'm going to say I'm talking about the right. It doesn't mean this couldn't happen on the left. Maybe it will. I mean, what we're talking about is almost, this is how the Bolsheviks talked in 1918. You know, you could, I can imagine, but right now this is the, this is the, this is the group which is, um, which is in power, or close to power, and so there I'm more interested in them. Um, so the question is, so you have this you know, group of people who want power, um, who feel excluded, who don't like these centrist parties anymore that they come from, um, who have this nihilistic impulse, this feeling that this current system doesn't work. So now the question is both how are they reaching people um, and why are they succeeding? Um, and how obviously um, is the internet and social media? Um, they are using. They were the mo they were absolutely the most innovative users of social media from the very beginning. And so, whether you call them the alt right in the U.S. or the, you know, or the far right in Europe, um, they were the ones who first understood how radical the internet was um, and and learned how to use it in new ways. Um, and let, you know, just a few, just a couple of thoughts about the about social media and, and the internet. Again, we've talked all talked about this a lot, and I, I hope I don't want to repeat stuff that everybody already knows. I mean, but we very rarely, I think, sit back and think about just how radical this the the change in the information system is. Um, the way in which people now get and process political information is completely different from what it was, you know, even ten years ago, but certainly thirty years ago. You know, most people now see the news by flipping through their phone and, see, and looking at headlines. I mean, that's how I see it, you know. Um, and I also, you know, I'm a, I'm a person who's, who's whose job is to think about politics, at least some of the time. Um, or they see it, you know, the, the, I mean, the combination of the internet and the multiplication of television stations and so on means that the way they see and think about politics is completely different. Um, and there are a number of ways in which this new system has changed, has changed politics. I mean, obviously, um, the, the, what I think is the permanent undermining of the mainstream media, which, you know, and there were good things and bad things about the mainstream, you know, the mainstream like the newspapers and television and, and broadcast television as traditional ways of getting news, political news. And there were many bad things about the old system, and I don't miss it and I don't want it back, but it did have a, it did have, it did have some things that were advantageous to democracy. And one of them was that it served as, 
a, um, a, they served as a filter, so they eliminated some of the most egregious conspiracy theories, although of course they made mistakes and they were, um, but more, more importantly, um, they created the possibility of a national conversation and a single debate. I mean, this is by the way, literally what the BBC was, cre and was created for. I mean, the, and when the founders of it um, thought of it as an institution that would now allow people from different parts of the country and different political backgrounds to have a single um, conversation. You know, in many democracies, there is now um, no common debate, you know, let alone a common narrative. So what I'm talking about isn't that people have different opinions, because people have always had different opinions. People don't have the same facts. Um, people don't, one group thinks one set of things is true, another believes something completely different. Um, and therefore, they're not even having one conversation anymore. And there is a real question as to whether um, you know, a democratic conversation is possible if you don't have one conversation. Even if it's a bad conversation, at least it's a single conversation. Um, we also have the phenomenon, obviously you all know about it, so I won't go into, you know, of, of the creation of echo chambers and uh, hyper-partisanship, and this um, phenomenon contributes to the growth of polarization, and polarization, which um, leaves people in very different spaces, also contributes to the distrust and lack of faith in so-called normal politics and, politic and, politi and, and politicians and political institutions. So if you're, you know, if you're somebody you know, in one group, or either over here or over here, and you look at political institutions, you, ought to, you tend to assume they've been captured by the other side. So one side, you think of, of mainstream, whether it's the judges or the civil service or the bureaucracy or, um, you know, or sometimes even the, the legislature, you tend to think it's the puppet of the other side if you're, if you're somebody who's in a very polarized um, group. The other phenomenon that the, of, the, of the way in which we now get news that I think doesn't get enough um, attention is that it also, our, our way of getting information also creates a sense of distance um, and a, you know, we don't participate in this news, we just kind of see it on our phones. And I think it's really not an accident that, you know, look, the internet is the, is, is the home of irony. Irony, parody, jokes, memes. I mean, this is how younger people now communicate on the internet. And so why are we so surprised that ironic and parodic and joke political candidates suddenly win elections, you know, in countries as disparate as, you know, Iceland and Serbia, um, so on. Some of these are harmless, you know, you get comedians standing for, um, you know, some aren't, you know, but the, the main point is that there's a generation of young people who now treat elections as an opportunity to show their disdain for democracy by voting for people who don't even pretend to have political views. So there's this voting for, you know, um, comedians or jokesters or, or something else. Um, the third, the other, again, this has been, everyone's talked about this to death, including me, which is that the new information network is also conducive to the spread of false rumors, um, whether generated naturally or imposed from outside. Um, it also has made possible a new set of political tactics. And again, the far right were the, really the first to understand how, um, how it is that social media favors extreme views, how you can get people's attention um, and, and spread stories more quickly um, by using extreme language. Um, they also understood um, how to use bot farms, fake websites. Um, one, I, again, while I was working on Vox last winter, I discovered this amazing pattern whereby, I mean, there must be a PR company somewhere that just does it for people. But the phenomenon of creating, it's not so much about, um, uh, you know, this a lot of argument about sort of fake news or fake advertise, advertisement on Facebook is a complete red herring, I think, because the real story is not just social media, it's you know the creation of fake news websites that look like news websites and that then serve as a source for stories that can be promoted using bot networks. So, um, and Vox, before it did well, and I mean, it didn't do as well as people thought it was gonna do, but before it was created in Spain, they created this network of false, news websites that looked like real news websites. You know, they'd named like Digital Sevilla, and they're sort of digital websites. Um, and then sets of um, uh, bot farms that promoted the language of these, the sort of stories that were being created on these websites and created this sense online of an alternate news system um, before one even exists. I mean, in the United States, we have an older version of this. You know, we have Infowars, we have Alex Jones, we have this set of, um, we have this set of, uh, conspiracy websites that function in the same way. And of course, this is of course exactly what the Russians did, um, both in the United States and all over Europe. They create false news stories, sometimes using their own, using Sputnik or using um, RT, and then they create um, networks of people who then pump this news into. So this is a new way of doing politics, which as I said, 
um, the, the far right just learned and used much more quickly and more effectively than, than anybody else. Um, they also learned to work together, um, although again, in the olden days, they, they used to fight over borders. Um, now they have, they, 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 you know, there are sort of ways of cooperating. I mean, just a little tiny example. Last year, the United Nations brought um, world leaders together to discuss global migration at a low key summit, you know, produce a very boring um, pact called the Global Compact for Safe and Regular Migration. And although this got almost no mainstream media attention, um, uh, the um, a, a company that I was working with in Spain found nearly 50,000 Twitter users tweeting conspiracy theories about the pact in multiple languages, you know, switching between French and German and Spanish um, and Italian, and they were again promoting material that described this pact as a com you know designed to undermine um, undermine um, uh, undermine um, current politics. Um, the other way that it's really important to understand the use of the internet is that it's also made it possible to create new political groupings where they didn't exist before. Um, and this is at a moment when you know a lot of our political parties are based on, used to be based on real institutions. So what was the left based on? The center left was based on trade unions. What was the center right based on? And here's, here's where we get to your issue. It was based on the church, right? A lot of center right part, the Christian Democrats, you know, to some extent, the Tories were based on real church organizations. They were people who met in real life. So those real life institutions disappear, and political entrepreneurs um, began to see that they could create new links between people um, online. Um, and they, you know, and they, you know, they understood how they could, um, how they could use the internet to do that. Now, I've just been told I have to stop, but I have kind of five more minutes. Go to five more minutes. You bet. We got the whole day. Please. I, I, I don't want to, I, but if I, I can stop if you no, want. No, no, please. Um, and then I just want to say a few words about the, 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 some of the real issues that they're using. Uh, you know, so then what are they putting on this, you know, this networks that they've created? And, and how should we think about it? Um, and here's where you know, I do want to talk about, I know that we're going to talk a lot more about immigration for the next two days. But I just a couple of words about immigration. I won't say anything very deep about it. Um, but I would like to remind you that um, to some extent, there's a real problem of immigration. And there is a real political debate about how many people we can take in, how much do they cost, are they beneficial or not beneficial to the economy, and so on. There's also a completely imaginary conversation about immigration. Or imaginary is maybe the wrong word. It's um, um, you know, theoretical. Um, in, in Hungary, there is no immigration, almost, I mean, minuscule. Um, there was a little bit after the Yugoslav Wars in the 1990s, and it actually, and so there were some people who moved from ex-Yugoslavia to Hungary, and those people were actually absorbed fairly well, and there was no issue over them, and there was no fuss made over them. They simply you know, be, learned Hungarian and became Hungarians. Um, currently, there is no migration into Hungary from the Middle East at all, okay, none. Nevertheless, you know, Viktor Orban has used immigration as an issue to galvanize people. So when you talk about immigration as an issue that is useful to someone like him, you have to explain why it's useful in the absence of actual immigrants. Um, you, there are other, you know, I did a project last year looking at Italy um, and looking at the, how the numbers and the real life is, you know, immigration story compared to news coverage of immigration. And, in, and we look, we've, we're focused on 2018. And in 2018, this is a year when immigration collapsed. It went way down. The numbers were going down. The ships were not arriving. The coverage of immigration and the topic and the, as a conversation went way up. Um, and this was everything to do with Salvini being, being deputy prime minister and putting that issue um, at the top of the political agenda. Um, you know, and the content that featured him got way more engagement than any other content. Um, and the, you know, and so therefore immigration has to be thought of. It's not just about, it's not just about the real issue. It also must be, it must be about some deeper things. Um, you know, and again, it connects back to the appeal or the, the fear, that, uh, you know, of this nihilistic, our civilization can't cope anymore. Our civilization is changing in ways that we don't know. I mean, uh, and I'll just throw out things that people can discuss later. I mean, it may be to do with the, in the US, there's this fear of, you know, the end of the dominance of, of white people, you know, the, the reversal of the, you know, so-called, what the expression is sometimes used, the natural order. Um, in the wake of Obama becoming president, you know, there's a fear that our race or our civilization is dying out. And I'm not saying this is explicit or that anybody says this necessarily, but it may be one of the things that underlies this anxiety. 
Um, there's the special case of Islam and terrorism. I mean, there's obviously, you know, the idea that immigrants bring terrorism is now kind of, you know, you know, many people, you know, assume that automatically. Um, there was an element in the European debate um, because it was Angela Merkel who, who, um, you know, who led in a, you know, large numbers of Syrians. In that case, there was an element of how come she's deciding for us what happens. You know, um, so there was this unilateralism of her decision that people, you know, people, you know, we're losing our ability to say what we want. And so, above all, there's this sense of loss of control. You know, that our, our, we aren't able to control, we aren't able to make the decisions that we used to make. And again, this nihilistic language appeals to people who have that fear. Um, I think connect again. Econ I'm, I'm one of those people who doesn't think that economics explains any of this either. Um, you know, again, we can have a long argument about inequality, and maybe we'll have that later in the day. Um, but you, then you have to, again, take into consideration, again, the case of Poland, which is an, an amazing economic success where everybody's richer than they used to be. And yet they have also this anxiety. And therefore, the anxiety can't be purely material. It can't be just about how high our taxes are. So, so again, I, and I would point to the psychological cost of, the, of 2009. It wasn't just that people lost their homes you know, because they lost their mortgages, the you know the, the the economic crash gave people. You know, we used to have this confidence: the West knows best, and our bankers know what they're doing. The 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 loss, uh, the feeling that you know the U.S. government, Wall Street, EU don't know what they're doing. You know that they, you know, made this mistake and they aren't in control. I think that is a that's one of the other pieces underlying this nihilism. Um, I think that's connected to the failure of recent military, you know, the feeling that Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, Syria, Ukraine, these are failed military conflicts in which the West doesn't seem to be playing a role. So there's this loss of confidence in, in the West and in, in, in our institutions to defend us and to, and to do the right thing. Um, and the third one I would say, you know, globalization, I would say the same thing about it. Um, economic decisions, you know, a factory in Nice can shut down because of a decision somebody makes in China. Um, you know, you're, you, you're, you can lose your job because someone in Washington has, has made a decision there. And this feeling that we don't control our own economics, our leaders don't control economics. And of course, they're right. I mean, it is true that, you, you know, that they don't control it. Um, and then the trouble here is that for, you know, leaving Europe, for example, doesn't fix that problem. It probably makes it works. You know, Brexit is a case in point. It turns out to be, you know, you may be even more dependent on foreigners if you leave. Um, ending trade or shutting down the borders isn't going to end it either. Um, what we are in is a new, situa a new situation of independent interdependence that we're not, um, that we aren't um, used to. Um, I'll stop there. I mean, I would, let me just make two other short points. I mean, I would say we also underestimate the role of changes to pop culture, um, politics as entertainment, and, the, and, and some of the nihilism that I'm talking about in this kind of apocalypse you can find there, you know, think about what are the values on television that created Ronald Reagan. You know, Reagan was connected to a kind of 1950s era of cowboy movies and Hollywood. And what are the values that created television values that created Donald Trump? I mean, it's a different, you know, reality television, whatever it is, voting people off the island, you're fired. Um, these are, um, you know, there's a vulgarity and cynicism in, in, in pop culture that didn't exist before. Um, and I'll, let me just say one final thing, um, which is that there is an, you know, some of the energy of these new movements, you know, is the energy of revolution, revolutions, and it also reflects a kind of boredom with the status quo. And also, I think we underestimate the role of boredom in politics. And so I will end with a quote from a um, famous essay written by George Orwell in 1941. And, and this is a review of, some of you might know it, it's a review of Mein Kampf, okay? And he writes this review of Mein Kampf, and, which he's just been translated into English. And he's writing about Hitler, and of course, you know, it's bad, and it's conspiracy theory, and so on. But then he ends with this thought, and he says, he's trying to understand what is the appeal of Hitler. And he says this, nearly all Western thought since the last war, certainly all progressive thought, has assumed tacitly that human beings desire nothing beyond ease and security and avoidance of pain. Hitler, because in his own joyless mind, he feels it with exceptional strengths, knows that human beings don't only want comfort and safety and shorter working hours and common sense. They also, at least intermittently, want struggle and sacrifice, and not to mention drums, flags, and loyalty parades. Um, so whereas socialism, he writes, and meaning his socialism of his era, and even capitalism in a more grudging way, have said to people, I offer you a good time, 
Hitler has said, I offer you struggle, danger, and death. You know, and as a result, a whole nation has flung itself at his feet. And I'll stop there. Thank you. In, in a lot of ways, Anne's just like basically framed um, what is a rock for the next round of conversation. Like the national populism conversation could have itself been a, a, a topic. And we uh, have a, a conversation with um, Matthew Goodwin uh, of the um, University of Kent that's brand new on the Faith Angle website that's sort of a different frame, different angle on these same you know, looking across one at a time at a time. What is going on? And is it a moment or is it longer term? Uh, and so uh, that's perhaps a compliment. Thank you, Ian. That's very helpful framing. Race and religion, and, excuse me, race and immigration and ethnicity as an aspect of this, uh, Eric Kaufman. I think there's a handout with Eric's remarks that should be before you. Yeah, and, and I apologize for being the quantitative poli-sci academic, so um, hence the slides. But I just want to say I, I'm not going to be anywhere near as wide-ranging as Anne. I'm focusing strictly on the West. That's Western Europe, North America, Australasia, and also only on right-wing populism, not on left-wing populism. I think there's a really important uh, frame for this, which is the global demographic revolution, which is really the, about the unevenness in um, global population trends around the world. So 97% of the world's population growth is taking place in the global south, the tropical belt, which is obviously non-European, but also highly religious, and the source of most of the immigration present and future for the West. What that means is, is a dramatic shift in the ethnic and religious composition of Western societies. Uh, and this is ultimately what I'm going to be arguing is behind the rise of right-wing populism. Um, if the West was like Japan or Korea, we wouldn't have right-wing populism, pure and simple. Uh, it is about immigration and ethnic change. Those changes are going to be dramatic already. We know in the US the shift from a population that was about 80, 85 percent non-Hispanic white in 1960 to what is projected to be only 50 percent of the population non-Hispanic white in 2050. That same process is occurring in New Zealand and Canada, both of which will also become majority minority around 2050. Canada, where I'm from, actually has a, you can look at the dramatic, there was a projection by Statistics Canada demographers that showed in the year 2006, the country was about 80% European origin, 20% non-European. A hundred years later, in 2106, those proportions will be roughly reversed. Now, that's not everywhere is going to move as fast as Canada, but th what David Coleman, the demographer, calls the third demographic transition towards this complete ethnic transformation of Western societies, I believe is the backdrop for what we're seeing in Western, not necessarily the East, which we can come to later, although I can talk about that. But this is why we're seeing right-wing populism in the West. And immigration is very much a, a symbolic lightning rod issue because it unsettles the identity of ethnic majority groups uh, and also people who are attached to the nation, but part of their national identity is the ethnic composition, the historic or the ethnic composition they've grown up with. Um, so someone might be Hispanic living in the United States and be attached to a conception of America that involves a white majority, oddly enough. And so if we look at Latino Trump voters, for example, uh, there's a poll done after the Charlottesville riots, which I produce in my book, where 70% of Latino Trump voters agreed with the statement that whites are under attack in America today. That's 70% of Latino and Asian Trump voters. Uh, the same percentage, by the way, as white Trump voters. So this idea of the sort of ethnic transformation of nations is, is ultimately central to the story. And immigration is very much the issue. The other issue, which I'll also talk about, is the so-called turn of the left from more economic class-based appeals to more identity-based appeals, uh, which I think is also a very important part of the story that hasn't always been uh, examined. So I'm going to look at that a bit. Um, I'm going to start, however, with this issue of, of what's driving right-wing populism in the West. And, and the very basic message here, similar to what Anne was saying, is really not the economy. Um, it is really about immigration. And I'm just um, going to look at a couple of charts here. The first one comes from the British election study, which has a sample size of over 24,000. So this is an incredibly large sample. This is a, 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 a taken after the Brexit vote. And we asked people, or the British election study asks, did you vote to leave the European Union? Um, that's on the vertical axis from 0 to a 0.8 possibility of saying I've, you know, of somebody voting to leave the European Union. And on the uh, 
horizontal, we have your views on immigration from allow many fewer at zero to allow many more at 10. If you, in Britain, said, I want many more immigrants, your chance of voting leave is about zero. If you said, allow fewer immigrants, which is a much larger group of people, obviously, uh, your chance of voting leave is above eight out of 10. Now, we compare that to these different colored income bands. So if we want to look at the economic side of things, yes, it's the case that the blue line, which is poor British people earning less than 15,000 pounds a year, are somewhat more likely to vote leave than people earning 60,000 pounds a year or more in yellow. But if you look at the distance between that blue line and the yellow line, that's only a 10 or 15 point difference. Whereas the gap between allow many fewer and many more is 80 points. And that's in Britain where, the, where we can get some kind of an effect on income. So essentially what we see there is that your attitudes on immigration are vastly more important than your income in determining how you voted in the referendum. Not only that, by the way, your attitudes on the death penalty are vastly more important uh, than income. Your attitudes on child rearing, strict or permissive, are about four times more important than income in how you voted in the referendum. Now, we could have changed income to class, to job status, to anything material. Those material factors really do not play much of a role in that Brexit vote. Something very similar in the Trump vote on the next page, if we look at the American National Election Study, um, the predicted probability of voting for Trump in 2016 against views on immigration. This is an even sharper story. Um, if you believe that immigration should be increased a lot, your chance of voting Trump is only about one out of 10. If you believe that immigration should be reduced a lot, it's over eight out of 10. So similar scale effect to the Brexit vote. And now if we look at these in income bands, there's nothing there at all, nothing statistically significant. And this is, by the way, controlling for age, income, and party ID. So essentially, in both cases, it's an immigration story and income, the economic factor, isn't playing at all. And we could go through different European populist votes. You have to look at the individual level data. I really think there's a lot of, a, a lot of problems are caused by people looking at election maps, which are incredibly misleading, or looking at any kind of aggregate level data. Cities have a lot of people who don't vote for populist right parties because they've got a lot of immigrants. They have a lot of people in their 20s and a lot of people with advanced degrees. If you actually strip that away, for example, white working class Londoners are as or more likely to have voted leave as white working class people in any other part of England, the, the most remote part of England. So it's not really so much uh, anything about London's economy or its international atmosphere. It's just what kinds of people are living there. Um, and so this idea of um, where your populist vote comes from is very psychological, very individual. 25% of two-person couple households in Britain had a split on the Brexit vote, and half of four-person households had a split on the Brexit vote. So this is not about regions or, or economics. It's about actually the psychological level of how individuals are wired. Um, I'll just give you an example. When, when it comes to immigration attitudes, this is from UK data, the next slide, where it says, how much do you agree with this statement? Family over everything. And we're only talking about 18 to 29-year-olds. Um, if you uh, are in favor of much tighter restrictions on immigration, um, you endorse that statement 73% to 18%. If you're in favor of much looser restrictions on immigration, you oppose that statement 50% um, to, to 35. Uh, an absolutely massive difference. And that's kind of getting at some of these psychological dispositions around attachment to family, to group. A lot of this is about attachment to ancestry and to majority ethnic group. Another uh, good question, which is from, again, from the YouGov profiles data, which has tens of about 40,000 sample. I usually go to the same place on holiday each year. <laughs> so what might that have to do with your immigration attitudes? Well, it turns out this is a very significant predictor. If you favor much tighter restrictions on immigration, you are 10 points more likely to say, I go on holiday in the same place each year than somebody. Uh, at th now, if we look at those who say, um, I favor much looser restrictions on immigration. By a three to one margin, they disagree with that. They're going somewhere different on holiday. Now, this is not an in, a factor of income. This is 18 to 24 year olds, upper middle class, white British. So we're controlling for the economic, for the age, uh, ethnicity, and we're seeing a dramatic difference. And what that's getting at is a bit of what 
Jonathan Haidt um, writes about, which is that, that you have these uh, differences which are about 50% genetic, actually. Uh, Pew did a study, uh, just some of the twin studies. What's that? It's from Karen Stenner. Jonathan well, gets it from Karen Stenner. Right, right. But, and Karen Stenner, so there's Karen Stenner, <laughs> who I'll talk about in a minute. But also, um, I, I, Pew did a summary, I think, of some of the twin studies and showed that these attitudes, which are sometimes referred to as right-wing authoritarianism, which is a preference for order and stability over difference and change. So if you see um, diversity and difference as disorder, as opposed to interesting, or, or if you see change as loss, not as something stimulating, right? And that is a heavily genetically conditioned and heritable disposition. And Stenner talks a lot about this in this great book, The Authoritarian Dynamic. Um, which means that these attitudes are unlikely to be easily shifted by some appeal to people to embrace diversity. Actually, what Stenner shows is quite the opposite. They will often react negatively to that kind of an appeal. And so we have these kind of deep psychological structures. Uh, some people like difference and change. Other people dislike difference and change. That filters through to immigration attitudes, which then filters through into populist right support. Again, this next slide, death penalty is very much uh, uh, related to some of these dispositions Stenner talks about. Uh, and so, for example, if you strongly disagree with the death penalty, then you're pretty happy in Britain, you're pretty happy with current immigration levels. Um, if, however, you strongly agree with the death penalty, you really want immigration reduce, reduced dramatically. And that's why death penalty is such a good predictor of the Brexit vote, actually, um, in Britain. It's also uh, important to note that in the Trump vote, death penalty supporters, uh, Trump got a much higher share of death penalty supporters than Romney did. Um, but anyway, that's, that's something else we can talk about. So the next question is, why now? I mean, if it's always been the case that you've had people who dislike disorder and difference uh, and change, what is it about the post-2014 or post-2013 period that has witnessed this upsurge? And basically, it is largely about immigration numbers. Um, now, of course, numbers are, are refracted through perception. But the first thing to note is that um, people care about immigration as a national issue. They're actually not that concerned with what's going on locally. So in Britain, if, if you ask people, is immigration a problem in your local area, only 20% say it is. Is it a problem nationally? 70%. Um, it's so it's very misleading to actually say, oh, this locality has very few immigrants. Why, why are people so anti-immigrant? Well, they're thinking of their imagined community of the nation, not their local community. Now, of course, if their local community is changing rapidly, then yes, that's going to give a shot in the arm to, to right-wing populism. But most places aren't changing that rapidly. So if we look at the national trend here in the next slide labeled chart one, which comes from Ipsos Mori, um, you can see that along the bottom, starting in, in January of 1984, uh, we're tracking three things. Um, immigration levels, something called the Issues Index, which is the number of people who say immigration is their number one or two issue, and media coverage of immigration. And these three trends are all moving together. So starting about 1997, when Blair comes into office, you see a big jump in the numbers of people being admitted into Britain from about 50,000 a year up to 150,000 a year later. And then pretty quickly, it's up to 250,000. And then under Cameron, it gets to 300,000. As that figure is rising, the number of people saying immigration is their leading issue rises from what's only a couple of percentage points as late as about 1998. Um, and it rises up to reach up as high as about 45%. Um, and that is what essentially is behind right-wing populist support. Um, so this salience measure, it's not, do you want immigration reduced or not? The, your attitudes on whether immigration should be reduced are heavily tied to your ideology and some of these psychological orientations I mentioned. What happens with the numbers is it boosts the salience level. So instead of immigration being your, you may oppose immigration, but it's your number five issue. At, when the numbers go up, immigration rises from number five to number one. And once it rises to number one, and it's a highly salient issue, that's when the populist right has the demand conditions to thrive. The next slide is really very similar on Italy, which just shows annual refugees and asylum seeker arrivals by sea, um, news coverage, and immigration. Again, the most important concern for Italy in the 
um, in the sort of green line and it starts to move up again once you get past the first half of 2014. Um, and then, so turning to the next page, I'm gonna try and summarize this in Europe. Um, we have two, two graphs here, one of which is from Eurostat, which is the European Statistics Agency. Um, and the blue line is, is the number of non-EU citizens uh, entering the EU. 2013, that starts to move up from about 500,000. Um, 2014, it rises again to a peak in the migrant crisis of almost 2 million before going back down again. And then if we look at the Eurobarometer uh, question on the uh, main concern of European citizens, the black line, which is immigration, moves from about 10% uh, in 2013. It sort of tracks the rise in numbers entering the country, or entering Europe, peaking in 2015, coming down somewhat in 2016-17. Um, so basically, the story here is immigration increasing, which drives up the salience level of immigration in the population. And as we'll see in the next slide, that's very much connected to populist right voting. Um, if we compare the economic crisis of 2007-8, that had no effect systematically whatsoever on either immigration opinion or populist right voting. So this argument that the economic crisis mattered, I think is very suspect. We have a nice natural experiment. We got an economic crisis, a migrant crisis. What matters for populist right voting? The migrant crisis. And that kind of links up very much with some of that opinion survey data we saw, which in terms of what predicts support for the populist right. Just to, to come then to the, the next slide on, there was a paper done by um, two political scientists at the European University Institute. Uh, James Dennison and Andrew Geddes, who looked at this question of the relationship between that salience measure, that is, how, is immigration one of your top issues, and support for populist right parties in the polls. Uh, and they found a significant cor time series correlation in nine out of 10 West European countries between 2005 and 2016, which kind of, even in the case of, you, know, you can look at particular countries, like in Germany, once Petri, uh, assume the leadership of the AFD, uh, there's a significant relationship between monthly refugee arrivals and rising support for the AFD. Uh, if you uh, look at, so for example, the AFD in Bavaria, 100%, not 99, but 100% of AFD voters in that election agreed with the statement, Germany is gradually losing its culture, uh, whereas only about 20% of green voters um, agreed with that statement. So. Yeah. Sorry, our slightly what's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, the the, the um, orange line is the salience of immigration. Uh, the blue. Sorry, I should. I, I'm I'm kind of whipping through these a bit quickly. Uh, the the orange. Yeah. Okay. Um. Anyway. Um. So I just want to come onto the next next slide, which is to do with uh, this question of. Levels. So there's two issues. One is the rate of increase in immigration, and the other is the level uh, of a particular um, minority group. Now, I, I actually don't put as much stock in this issue of the Islamic threat being the driver of this as other people, but I think as a sort of barometer of the rate of ethnic change in a society, it's a useful one, because it's very tough to get good numbers in Europe because a lot of immigrants in European countries are Europeans from nearby countries. And so it's hard to sort of screen out and focus on exactly which populations are seen as different and as changing the composition of the population. But one thing you can do in Western Europe, again, focusing on Western Europe, is you can look at the projection, uh, the projected Muslim share of the population in 2030. So that involves two things. One is the current Muslim share and the second is the rate of increase in the Muslim share. Um, and if you put those th two things together, Pew has come up with this projection. And you can see there is a po very strong positive correlation between the projected Muslim share in 2030 and the highest uh, vote or poll for a populist right party in a West European country. So Portugal and Iceland and Ireland with their small Muslim shares in 2030 are unlikely to have the demand conditions not, the demand conditions are not as good for the rise of right-wing populism as, say, France, Sweden, um, Britain, and so forth. So part of this, then, is this idea of uh, the change in the population. And what rapid immigration does is it unsettles 
the taken for grantedness of these ethnic majority identities and, and national identities. And that's what's driving, I would argue, uh, this trend. And the next slide, which is from Nate Bresnow, who did a, a blog at the LSE, is simply suggesting that if we continue, you know, given this, the rise, the gradual rise in the foreign born share in Europe, up now to about 15% in, in 17 West European countries, you see the um, populist right. Now, it's not a linear relationship. There are supply conditions, absolutely. So I would never deny that. But we should expect that we are only at the beginning of um, this trend, I would say. That, that we should be, expect to be living with this phenomenon for some time to come, given the demographic shifts that are continuing to occur and are already baked in, by the way, due to age structure. So the younger population, more diverse than the older population. Uh, and that means that even without immigration, we're going to see these changes continue. So, um, and, the, and the current projections are actually quite significant. Britain and Sweden are, are likely to see a tripling of their Muslim share between now and 2050. So about 17% of the UK, according to Pew, whose projection methodology I'm, I'm pretty familiar with since I know the people who worked on it. I think it's very sound. So we're likely to see in, in the UK an increase from 6% Muslim in the last 2011 census to 17% Muslim in 2050. That, I think, is going to be a big question for um, British politics, not so much the European question. I just now want to, uh, how much time do I have? Oh, good five minutes. Good five minutes, OK. I, I just want to pivot and talk a little bit about the turn of the left, this shift from more class-based to identity-based appeals, which I think is a very important part of the story. The reason it's a part of the story is because um, the increased focus on race in particular uh, by the left and disadvantaged racial groups means that there's been uh, what some psychologist Nick Haslam calls a concept creep, particularly around the ter terms like hate and racism. What that means is that a greater sensitivity to um, and optics of racism means that mainstream parties and institutions have a much harder time in talking about, for example, reducing immigration. If that has a whiff of being unkind to minorities or, or racism in a climate where the um, cultural left has increasingly been able to perhaps shape some of the norms of civilized discourse, the kind of Upperton windows shrunk, that means the only people who can really address this issue are those who are outside that Upperton window. So I use the example of a Soviet department store. If they're only selling one pair of pants, <laughs> if you want something different, you're going to have to go to the black market. And so if this Overton window is forcing the mainstream parties to only offer one pair of pants, then the only people who are going to offer something different are the populist right entrepreneurs. Um, so in a way, without the populist, uh, or sorry, without the identity left kind of shrinking the space for discussion of these issues, I don't think there would have been the market space for populist right parties in the West to thrive. The other thing we find also, now there's been about five experiments that show when you tell people um, Trump or uh, UKIP's policies are racist, you, when you use certain terms, that triggers a negative backlash in a section of, uh, of the people who read that passage. So there's also a direct backlash effect to the use of some of these terms. And so what that, that's actually producing then is you have a, an identity left which is moving increasingly in the direction of expanding the meaning of racism to encompass things such as reducing immigration. Um, Sweden is a good case where the, the uh, interior minister tried to raise the immigration issue in 2013. He was attacked as a racist, couldn't raise it next, next year. The Sweden Democrats come in on about 13%. So they were able to own this issue because the mainstream parties couldn't. Once the populist right comes in, the mainstream then decides to move on to their turf and can get a lot of that vote back again, but, but um, only after the taboo is kind of broken by the populist right. Um, in terms of the interplay, I think it's quite interesting, this interplay between the um, identity left and the populist right. And I think they're actually feeding off each other to produce a kind of polarization. And we can see it just in this next chart, which was some research that I did um, in the US and Britain. This is on the United States, though, and asks a question, which I think is kind of central to the debate, which is, is tribalism racism if you are a member of an ethnic majority? So the question here is, a white American who identifies with her group and its history uh, supports a proposal to reduce immigration. Her motivation is to maintain her group's share of America's population. Um, is this person, A, to paraphrase Shadi, who's who I got this idea from, by the way, of racial self-interest, is, is A, just acting in her racial self-interest, 
So it's just rational group behavior. Um, there aren't many white immigrants. The best method for maintaining your numbers is going to be to restrict numbers. So is this just group self-interested behavior, which isn't racist, or is it being racist? And it turns on the definition of what you think of when you think of the word, word racism, which I think is a very important question. And so we see so white Clinton voters uh, with postgraduate degrees, 91% say it's racist. And white Trump voters without uh, degrees, it's only 6%. Uh, in Britain, uh, leave voters without a degree, that number is zero. Um, and so we see this vast difference. It's not just about do you like immigration or not. It's also is restricting immigration, particularly for cultural reasons, uh, immoral and racist. So it's kind of a, a, a values-based split layered on top of the split over the actual cultural impact of immigration. So you actually have the, the left liberal part of public opinion reacting to the uh, populist right part of public opinion, and they're kind of feeding off each other. Um, what's interesting is non-white Americans kind of lie in the middle on a lot of these questions. So ethnic minority Americans, only about 45% say this person is being racist. And even minority Clinton voters, only 58%. And that's true. We find that on a lot of questions where white liberals are most likely to see racism, white conservatives least likely, and minorities somewhere in the middle on, on particularly questions of identity. And so on the next slide, we can see what this has done on this hot button issue of immigration. Just looking at white Americans who vote Democrat or Republican, um, really right up until Romney, uh, the Romney-Obama contest 2012, the, the gap on whether you want to reduce immigration between Republicans and Democrats was only about 10 points. And then suddenly with Trump, uh, it's, you know, when Trump comes in, Trump versus Clinton, you get a 50-point gap. Uh, and that's reflecting not just people switching into the Republican Party who don't like immigration, but also Democrats reacting against Trump's rise, going the opposite direction. And now 60% of white liberals say more immigration is what we want. So a real split on this question. Canada, which, by the way, just had an election and the populist, new populist party only got 1.5%. So people are thinking, ah, you know, populism is not an issue. If you look at... Canadian public opinion, you can see the same pattern. Five years ago, there was almost no difference, maybe 10 points between the conservatives and liberals. There's now a 50-point gap between the conservatives and liberals. And in Britain, there's, of course, a 50-point gap on immigration, 40 to 50 points between leavers and remainers. So again, this interplay between the uh, identity left and the populist right, I think, is a very important dynamic. Um, but ultimately, what underlies all of this, I would argue, is the uh, the demographic shifts of which immigration is an important symbol um, and not economics. Okay, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you both. Um, to me, obviously, the explosive idea on the table here is that there's something fundamentally tribal about people um, that, um, that disposes them to um, heed these appeals against immigration and to favor the parties that support it. Um, the further idea is that if the mainstream parties did more to acknowledge the legitimate concerns to the extent they're legitimate of people about losing, I don't know how to describe this in an acceptable way, ethnic control of their countries, um, that that would somehow help to diffuse the strength of the far right parties. Is that true? Is there evidence for that? I mean, if you're going to put this idea forward, Obviously, we would like to some assurance that it will actually work. So Eric, you were describing a situation in Sweden. And I guess I'd like to hear more about that or any other examples we have from history. Um, if you have statistics on it, that's even better. To show that if the mainstream parties played more to satisfied um, public concern about losing ethnic control, that that would somehow um, net out better for the country in terms of um, less power for the far right, and possibly less racism overall? OK. Yeah, uh, good, a really good question. I, I think definitely the center parties have been able to take back significant market share from the populist right by addressing this issue, I would say. I mean, you can look at a whole series of examples. Um, the, um, if you look at Austria, for example, um, that, you know, the OVP has managed to to certainly eat strongly into the FPO vote. Even Theresa May, in a way, 
eating into the UKIP vote, um, Mark Rutte in the Netherlands. I think even Macron, some of the things, you know, I mean, there are a number of ways in which the set, I think this is very much about an issue. So the, there's no reason why the mainstream parties can't take that, that vote back. The only problem will be if they don't deliver. So Cameron, in a way, was successful in talking about this issue, but then he wasn't able to deliver the number decline, and so he was, at, he was vulnerable. Um, now, I think, you know, if we look historically, we, I think, again, historically, it, it would be surprising if we weren't seeing populism. I mean, you can, you can go out, ex, there are the places where we've seen large scale, culturally different immigration. So Irish Catholics moving into central Scotland, late 19th century, early 20th century, you got populist, a Protestant populism emerging in, in force. Um, once the assimilation occurs, then the populism uh, declines. So I think ultimately the solution for, to this is, uh, you know, immigration levels plus assimilation is the way in which this goes away. But I think, it, you know, expecting that you can have high immigration levels, not a lot of necessarily, in, there is assimilation going on, but it's not going on fast enough, especially deep level intermarriage and ethnic assimilation. Um, so I think we do have evidence that this issue can be, can be sort of owned by the mainstream to a large degree. Um, and I do think, um, but I ultimately think there has to be some reassurance to the majority. And one way of doing that is to point to successful assimilation. Uh, I've done an experiment where, where, we, where I do exactly that, where we describe, if you tell a story about Britain getting more and more and more diverse, that's a really bad message for people who don't like diversity. If, if you talk about immigrants assimilating as they always have, melting away, nothing really changing, then that's a really significant good message for uh, UKIP voters, for example. Um, so something about having a different message to those voters from the message that just says diversity and change and embrace it. I think there has to be some acknowledgment that not everyone likes that. That's all. Yeah. Henry Olson with the Washington Post. Please oh, sorry, go ahead and follow up. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on w one statistic you quoted that I thought might bear on this, and I don't know, and perhaps you can say what you think about it. Um, it was uh, about local versus national uh, immigration that correlate that there was uh, like a 50 point gap, I think, in terms of um, what people thought about their local immigration versus their national immigration. Well, I don't remember exactly what the That's statistic right, yep. was. But does that bear on this? Is there anything that we should take from that uh, in terms of encouragement that local people's actual experience of immigrants was not problematic in a way that somehow the abstract numbers, once they heard, when they heard them, was a problem. And that some, does that bear on your point about assimilation working? Yeah, I, I think it is less problematic locally. Um, I agree with you. And actually, there is some evidence that local areas that have a higher, you know, people who live in these very diverse areas have a somewhat lower uh, so so the, there, there's something called the contact effect, where if they get to know real immigrants, that does reduce hostility. But it only reduces it a little bit. And it's a small effect. Um, so we don't want to make too much of that. So it does, you're right. So the actual interactions, I don't think, are necessarily the problem. But it's this symbol, symbol of losing what you know, what you're attached to as your imagined community of the nation. Can I answer that? Please, sure. <laughs> uh, so I think there's another explanation for that phenomenon, which is the one that I mentioned, which is that a lot of the anxiety isn't about real, first of all, it's not about real immigration necessarily. Um, secondly, it's about you know this, this chart that shows that, that it's actually the salience of immigration rather than the numbers that affect people, that affect the populist vote is really important because you, you also have to factor in the, you know, the, the far right entrepreneurs who have created this issue in some cases. I mean, in some cases where there's no immigration um, in some cases where they have you know, built it up. And the reason why it's effective as a national theoretical issue is that people are reading about it in the newspapers or reading, hearing about it from Salvini or whatever it is. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily something that affects them in real life. You know, so so you, you know, the question is, you know, this chart also worries me. Immigration numbers affect salience. Is it the numbers affecting salience or is it the far-right messaging that is creating the salience. I mean, because the far-right messaging begins you know, a decade ago you know, with uh, people learning how to use the internet to do the messaging. And I'm not denying that immigration, I mean, there are real stories and you know, the, the pictures of Syrians marching over the, you know, over the mountains and coming across on boats and so on was, also, was very important, that was real, 
But there was also an unreal aspect to it, which was the creation of hysteria around it. Um, and, yep. and that seems to be more important than the real numbers. Yeah, well, I, I, there's no question the media has independence here in, in framing. The only thing I guess, the, the question- The media and the, alt, and the alt, alternative media. Yeah, and the alternative, but there's a couple of things. First of all, we know that populist right voters are less likely to be social media users and online news consumers in general. So the, I think the argument about social media users being more likely to vote populist right, no paper I've ever seen has actually shown that relationship. Now, that doesn't mean it's not there. So it could be that the alt-right sort of niche media is affecting discourse in some roundabout way. It affects way. the intellectuals of the world. Right, yes. Yeah. So, so I, th I certainly agree with that. But I think the other thing, too, is there is a correlation between numbers and news coverage. So, And in Britain, they've done polls that have asked people, is there enough coverage of immigration? And, and it used to be, prior to about 2010, people were saying, the, the media isn't paying enough attention to this issue. And the MPs were getting a lot of mail from constituents who were very worried about this issue. And they were saying it wasn't covered enough in the media. And then the media was covering it. And then eventually they said, yeah, it's being covered enough. Um, so I, I think, I don't know. The question is, what drives media coverage of an issue? You will know more about that than I do. Uh, but I think if it was a, just about manufacturing hysteria, we would have seen this at other times. And it wouldn't be so correlated with numbers. The, the thing is that it is, the numbers really do correlate to the media coverage. But they don't always. I mean, I, I right. literally did a project in Italy. We, we, we measured right. immigration numbers and we measured media coverage and they were going in opposite directions. Uh, immigration was falling dramatically and media coverage was rising exceedingly. And, and support for Salvini was going up along with it. Okay. You know, I mean. Uh, I take issue with you on the, on the mean, macro trends. I have to show, show it to you afterwards. OK. Anyway. The, the political lens, <clears throat> we've got Henry, uh, Simon Cooper, David Brooks, Osgoodness. Henry, go ahead, please. I'd just like to make a couple of comments. One, with respect to Will, there's at least four examples in Europe of mainstream parties taking back the vote. The one in Austria, where the FPÖ is leading in the polls in the run-up to not the most recent elections, but the one before that. Uh, the Christian Democrats changed their leader and put in 31-year-old Sebastian Kurtz, who is known for his hardline views on immigration. Literally, the polls change overnight. 10% uh, of the Austrian electorate, about a third of the FPÖ vote, switches to the UFP because they've got a mainstream leader who respects their viewpoints, and he's now the chancellor. It happened in the most recent Danish elections, where the Social Democrats went so far as to vote for the populist party's restrictionist measures. Uh, and won back a lot of their votes uh, and collapsed the Danish People's Party vote in half in the most recent elections. In the Netherlands, uh, the Geert Wilders Party was leading in the polls in the run-up to the most recent Dan Netherlands election. Uh, Mark Rutte, the center-right uh, prime minister, publishes a letter uh, in the leading paper, I think that basically right. says, act normal or get out. Uh, to the immigrants. Uh, again, it changes overnight, and uh, this drop for the support. And in Norway, there's an anti-immigrant libertarian party called Progress. And the agrarian party that's aligned with the center left called the Center Party has been taking an increasingly anti-immigrant line. And it's now the third largest party as it's eating away at this support. And uh, in the next Norwegian elections, if that continues, the center left dominate, supported by an anti-immigrant centrist party, will take power. So there's four examples that show that that can happen. Um, and the thing I wanted to comment about you is I really think that that is the question, is that if there is this totalitarian or anti-democratic far right, the way to deprive them of support is to actually listen to the voters. Um, you know, but when I look at this, your chart one about the salience in Britain, Eric, I wanted to ask you about this, is because what it shows is salience rising along with numbers dramatically between the Blair election in 97 and the second Blair election in 2005. Right. But what we know is that there was no significant rise in support for UKIP or the British National Party, the race it, between that period. And then we go from 05 to 010 and the great financial recession, or great financial crash as it's called, right. <laughs> intercurs. Uh, salience drops a little bit, but it's still pretty strong. Um, and there's still no huge rise. It rises to maybe 4 or 5% of the national vote. What happens? UKIP. UKIP. Well, UKIP uh, okay. and BNP combined. Okay, yeah. UKIP gets about 3% of the vote, and BNP is about a point and a half. 
Um, but what happens is the blue collar abandons labor for data count. That um, you take a look at the Tory seat, the target seats going to 2010. They all, they're all targeting high wealthy areas. They do not win there. They win because they get an unexpected shift of the vote in places like Canic Chase, uh, right. <laughs> blue collar constituency. And then Cameron fails to deliver. Salience rises again, and that's when you get the move to UKIP and the victory in the 2014 EU referendum where UKIP gets 29% of the vote that sets in motion the need for the referendum because Cameron realizes that he cannot win in the 2015 election without getting back this year. So, right. so what that tells me is, one, do I have this wrong? Uh, but two, it tells me there's a large degree of willingness to let mainstream parties deal with the issue. Mm -hmm. And then it's actually mainstream party refusal to right. deal with the issue that fuels this. And then with respect to Anne's point on Hungary, there's actually data, I was looking at the Hungarian polls, that when the EU migrant crisis hits in the spring of 2015, Fidesz is only getting about 38% of the polls and the hard right Anti, you know, hard right, anti democratic at the time, Jobbik party is rising to nearly 30%. So you've got a choice there. You know, Orban could ignore that and accept the country quotas, which would have right. introduced migration. There is no migration in Hungary, right. but the EU wanted to force it, as, uh, and he refused, which predictably would have led to a rise in support right. for an anti nationalist party. Right. Um, so, in that sense, his re-election in 20, you know, the most recent election in 2018, is in, and making this an issue is in a way keeping this nationalist, even worse party out. So um, it's you know, a bad choice, <laughs> but what's the right. choice they would, what, what, you know, that's actually reacting like a Democrat would do, which right. is actually taking the will of the people. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the, the key question, I think, for the mainstream parties is when, when does something cross like an ethical line, right? So, so I, I absolutely think that the mainstream parties, as you you know, as you say, by mark putting their tanks on the lawn of the populist right, are going to be able to get their votes to a large degree. Um, and it's just a question of when does that become negative. You know, obviously, Fidesz is 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 kind of you know doing a lot of nasty things, so that's that's not a great example. But um, you know, I think a, a good comparison might be sort of George Wallace in the U.S. who is running on the segregationist platform and gets sort of whatever it was, 13% or 14% of the vote. Uh, but of course, it's a terrible platform because it's talking about segregation. Um, and so that's violation of civil rights. But something like immigration reduction is not, in, in my view, not in that same category. Unless, unless you're actually attacking immigrant groups and saying Muslims are awful and can never be Germans. or that That's where it's a cross of the line. But I think there's a distinction between um, sort of I think there's a very important distinction between attachment to own group and dislike or hatred of out groups. And in the psychological literature, it's a very clear distinction. These are not correlated dispositions, except in a time of, of violent conflict. So in the American National Election Study, if you, if you ask white Americans, how warm do you feel towards whites, uh, the, the white Americans who are, who are very warm towards whites are not feeling cooler towards blacks and Hispanics than the white Americans who don't feel particularly warm towards whites. Uh, that's just an example of this broader phenomenon. And I think we need to get into the distinction between uh, something we really don't want, which is hatred of outgroups, and, and something that is actually something we need to accommodate, which is attachment to in-group. Um, to some extent, we have to, I think, accommodate that. Yeah. Let's go to Simon Cooper. Can you just hit your button, <clears throat> Simon, if you wouldn't mind? Thanks. Yeah, you have this chart on immigration, still the top concern of EU citizens. Right. However, it's dropped 20 points in 2015-16. 2015-16, very peculiar moment, immigration, migration crisis, uh, terrorist attacks in Paris and Brussels. Unfortunately, the Brexit vote happened just then. <laughs> Might have had a totally different outcome otherwise. Given falling salience, and especially in Britain, where salience has fallen, I think, for nearly a decade. I think similar in the US, but I'm not sure that it's declining in salience. Might this be a problem for the populist parties? I mean, you say they will continue to do better as immigration rises, but we could have a, we could have a movement, as Anne says, where immigration rises, but salience falls. Right. Well, I guess... Or immigration falls and salience rises. Right. Which is what I think has happened. 
Yeah. Right. Um, you know, the salience is more important than the actual. Yeah, in, I miss quite a few. Right. I miss quite a few, but I hope I got a bit of the sentiment. Right. right. Well, I mean, I guess my view on this is, if the mainstream parties keep immigration levels low, then this that that the the, the populist right will do worse over time. They want they're not going to drop to where they were before, but I think they will not be able to rise substantially in, um, unless they find other issues. So, I mean, just to sorry to interrupt, but so the the way it's worked so far, so I you know, I didn't have time to do everything, but in both Hungary and Poland, for example, where immigration does not work anymore as a as a thing to galvanize fear and hatred because there aren't any immigrants and after a while people are like, where are these black people that haven't emerged? Um, so where it doesn't work anymore, they've created new sources of fear and hatred. Okay, so in Hungary they created George Soros. You know that he is a threat to Hungary. He's trying to, he's, you know, manipulating against Hungary. There were big posters of Soros, literally huge billboards all around the country. You know, he's he's a threat to our nation, and there's a long narrative about him. And in Poland, the the focus shifted to um, gays. So there was a there was a we just had an election, and in the Two days before the election, state television, which is now controlled by the ruling party, did a huge documentary called Invasion, LGBT Invasion. By the way, they use the word expression LGBT because it makes no sense in Polish. <laughs> it sounds foreign. What is this LGBT? That is, um, and they use LGBT Invasion with sort of shocking photographs of you know men in weird costumes, you know, and they're invading us. They're you know we need to keep our nation together because of this foreign invasion that's coming. In. And the and the anti-gay line has been has been you know for the past year you know the main source you know the the the, the center of their of their political argument. Um, and so the question is whether the immigration issue became salient because these groups you know learned to use this to create this new identity, which is now because of the just you know the the collapse of the of the um, traditional parties, um, whether immigration was a tool that they used to you know as a kind of form of um, uh, political entrepreneurship, and now they're shifting. Now they will shift to other things, whether it's going to be gay rights or you know, in Spain, feminism is a very important galvanizing sort of anti-feminism rather is a very important galvanizing factor too. So whether they're you know, it, you know whether immigration is the real problem or the problem is the the marketing of fear and how easy it's become. Right. I mean, I, I I think there's a distinction, say east-west in this in this, and you can see it actually in. Germany, because Germany has a, you know, East Germany was communist. And if you look at the AFD vote, for example, um, the drivers in East and West are quite different. Um, that in West Germany, it's, it's all about immigration. In the East, however, there's this Eastern effect, which I think is to do with a, a less liberal political culture because of just a different socialization pattern. So I think that's, when you've got that less liberal political culture, then it can sort of weaponize different things. I, whereas I just can't see the, Gay thing, uh, you know, having a lot of traction working, working in the West. In Spain, a little bit. I mean, there's right. a, there's a. Uh, What's that? In the countries with a strong traditional Catholic background, right. feel threatened by modernity. There's a popular base right. for that because they, that's the thing that they see as under attack. Just like in the United States, where you have a large Orthodox religious minority that feels under attack oh, yeah. by what they would characterize as secularizing. Mm -hmm. You find mobilization over something that actually matters. To Right. Well, the, that touches yeah. on their identity. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with that. And the only thing is, I, I think, say, in the U.S. case, it's actually been the decline of the re religious right and the shift away from religion, uh, kind of Europeanization, shift towards ethnocultural immigration, those issues, and away from some of the religious themes around you know, abortion, gay marriage, etc. I mean, I guess I'd see U the U.S. continuing in that direction a little bit. Not entirely. Of course, you've still got the religious right, but I think it's moving in a more European direction in it terms is, of the... But what I'd just say is that, <coughs> that right. what that means is that the religious right has moved from the offensive to the defensive right. direction. Rather right. than saying we yeah. want to <laughs> right. attack, right. it's that we want to protect our renown. Right, right. First up uh, from here in France is Christine Ockrant. Yeah, thank you, Josh. I have a, a question for Eric. When you talk in the Brexit context about immigration, um, do you mean immigration from Eastern Europe, as indeed was used, the Polish plumber figure right. and everything? Because when we talk about immigration in France, obviously, uh, it relates to Islam. It's Muslim immigration and all the fears that may go 
with it. So to, to, what, exec, to what extent uh, can you actually uh, make that distinction, that sort of ethnic mm -hmm. distinction, when you talk about immigration as it varies vastly, it seems to me, from one European country to the other? Yeah, I mean, I suppose by majority ethnicity, by the term ethnic, ethnicity, I'm talking about uh, groups that believe themselves to be of shared ancestry and have particular cultural markers. So one of those markers could be race, as you say, but another one could be language. And, and so even though someone is the same race, say Polish, uh, that doesn't mean they're of the same ethnic background. Um, and so, that, so they're still bringing in that difference. If your high street changes and it's a lot of Polish shops or you're hearing the Polish language, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, I think if you actually look at the vote, Prior to the Brexit vote, you actually had a lot, you had more non-European than European immigration coming into Britain. So both the non-European and the European, and they both matter, actually. It's not just the case this was about East Europe. It's just that that was more acceptable to talk about because it didn't have the same racial implication. Uh, the Labour MP, Frank Fields, makes, you know, there's a quote in my book from him saying that once the East Europeans came, it became okay to talk about immigration, uh, again, showing the power of those uh, polite norms of, of the Everton window and what you're allowed to talk about. Um, but actually, if you, if you poll Brexit voters and ask them how many non-European and, and European immigrants should come in, they actually prefer a slightly larger number of European to non-European. So there, it's not, both of these things mattered. And the fact that conservatives weren't able to bring down the non-European numbers was a factor. Uh, so it's not just European, it's both that combined. And, and one of the bizarre aspects of the Brexit vote is yeah. that to some degree it was a vote against whatever Muslim, foreign, non-European immigration. But of course the Brexit vote, if, if, you know, if we do have Brexit, the result will probably be that those numbers go up and European numbers go down. Which, which so, is where yeah. Boris was. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, a lot of illogical things about Brexit, and that's one of them. The, yeah, and, the, and that's the, why the, I think. The, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. That's all. But I think Boris will be in trouble one, you know, if there is Brexit. He'll be very exposed on this issue. David Brooks from New York Times. I have one shallow question, one deeper one. Uh, the shallow question for both is um, if immigration is so central, why are the Democratic candidates so stupid? Because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Warren and Sanders are running 90% economic campaigns. And the only candidate who I think distinguished himself by really focusing on race, diversity, and ethnicity was Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> and he's out. So explain. <laughs> uh, the deeper question is, I'd like to hear you both talk a little more about the psychological root of what divides some people from being pro-immigration and anti-immigration. And I'm a little impatient with the twin studies, in part because I, I think they ignore geography. Like if you're born in Wyoming, there's a really high chance you're a Republican. If you're born in California, there's a really low chance. It seems to be like events matter a lot more than the twin studies allow. And the twin studies emphasize correlation rather than life as narrative, which is how we actually live it. And so in the second demographic transition, there were, we had, like in the 60s, we had this divide over autonomy, individualism. It accompanied political stances, but also family raising styles. And that turned out to be a pretty good predictor because it, it got at some core value differences between one side and the other. And are we still living in that world where the key divides are about autonomy, individualism, authority, order, structure, hierarchy? Or in this third demographic transition, are there other value divides that really are, or psychological divides that are really driving the difference? Who wants to go first? I can, I can. So first of all, I, I don't think immigration is central. I mean, that was one of the... You know, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. I mean, so you've just heard Eric, Eric does, so maybe that's a difference between us. Um, I think it is part of what is, you know, and what I was trying to explain is what is driving, you know, authoritarian populism. So anti-democratic movements, which you can say, you can talk about a part of the Republican Party, maybe a part of the Brexit vote, not all of it. You can talk about a couple of political parties, you know, this group of political parties across Europe. And I think Im immigration is... Um, is some, is a is something they use, but I don't think it's the I don't think it's at the center of what of their appeal. I think it's a part of their appeal, um, a part of their as you know. And the real you know the center of their appeal is more to do with this um, you know deep doubt about the nature of modern civilization, if you want to put it in a very grandiose way. And that comes from 
you know, we both uh, existential, we are losing our place in the world, whether we as white people or we as Poles or we as Italians or we as French people. Um, and, the, and, and the challenge is coming from lots of things. It's coming from globalization. It's coming from the changing nature of capitalism. It's coming from, you know, the information revolution and the, and the data revolution, which is going to eliminate jobs. And so what they're, and what they're capitalizing on is fear and anxiety, which have risen. Um, and, and they now have a better way to use it and sell it and target people who are most susceptible to it. Um, and immigration is an aspect of this, but I don't think um, it is the whole story. Um, and, you know, one of the, you know, and given how that immigration is, you know, that, you know, because the anxiety about immigration isn't necessarily connected to the real problem, you can get very distracted by trying to solve immigration, whatever, build walls or, you know, because you can then miss what the other issues are. And actually, the Democrats or whoever, um, you know, opponents of the populist right, talking about, you know, in the US, it's health care, because that's a, you know, people don't have it. And it's a source of anxiety. But sometimes, sometimes, you know, changing the subject and getting back to other issues that are bothering people, um, or creating narratives about making people safer, physically or healthier or more secure in the in the economy can often be the solution to populism rather than just following this line about immigration you know okay they say immigration is the most important issue i say the most important issue is healthcare and that actually worked for the democrats 2 years ago or 1 year ago whenever it was the midterms you know change the subject and you might you know and the and just one of the, you know this idea that if only the center right would talk about immigration then everything would be okay that you know there are a couple examples where that's true and Austria is a really good one um, there are also some counter examples the most famous one being um, um, you know I mean, oh, sorry I mean you know the, oh and sorry the most famous one being um, uh, you know again um, Central Europe where you don't have you know, you know, there's no, there's no immigration narrative to, um, you know, there's no real action to be taken, and so that's that clearly isn't the solution. Um, also, this idea that assimilation will fix the problem, which is very appealing to all of us. You know, if we could just assimilate people and they would speak English or whatever or French and they would become French, then there would be no problem. Um, you have to remember that Nazi Germany, you know, the success of Hitler's project. Um, and his uh, you know, anti-Semitism happened at a moment when the Jews were more assimilated than they'd ever been in history. And that um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's these parties that are able to use this issue rather than the issue itself. So, I mean, not, not that there isn't a real issue, but sometimes you have to. Um, as for your question about um, personality types, I don't know the answer. I mean, the, the, I think what both Jonathan Haidt, you know, what he is getting his, his ideas from is this Karen Stenner book, which describes people who find, um, well, you, you, you already said it. You know, there's some people who are bothered by diversity and bothered by change and prefer unity and homogeneity and so on. Um, and whether that's, you know, presumably like all personality traits that can be affected by geography and education. I mean, I would probably reject the idea that it's somehow totally genetic. But in the, in the you know, in the, um, you know, in the um, there's always an argument about how much is genetic and how much is learned. I mean, there must be elements of both. I mean, maybe if you grew up in Wyoming and all of your life you've been surrounded by people who look the same as you and talk the same as you, maybe you're you're more likely to find diversity a problem than if you're born in New York City. But I don't have, I don't have yeah. a better answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think on the psychology, you know, it's it, first of all, it's only fifty percent heritable anyway. So there's already that 50% to play with. So it's that middle group that is malleable. The other thing is, is, so people might want homogeneity, but it is possible, depending on the framing, maybe if religion is the bigger issue and it's about gay rights you know, or, or some other issue, then the desire, you know, the hostility to difference and disorder will express itself in a religious idiom. Um, it's just that. When you have this demographic change going on, it, it, it tends to incline societies towards discussing the idiom of, of migration and, and ethnocultural change. So I, I kind of think whether we were having this immigration issue now or 50 years ago or 100 years ago, it would be the same general response. And again, we've seen it, you know, US immigration history, the 1850s, the 1890s, 1920s period, or, or 
in Britain too with the Irish immigration. Um, I, I don't think it must, much matters what the economic structure is, that this, this issue would have led to a populist uh, upsurge and reconfigures politics, by the way, by making cultural issues more important than economic. So in Scotland, during that period with the Irish migration, the conservatives got a lot of working class voters who were Protestant, who were anti-Catholic or, or didn't like this migration. So I think it's, and the same thing's happening to the conservatives in Britain now. They're getting a lot of working class voters on cultural issues. Um, but the only, the yeah. immigration is not the only cultural issue. I mean, there are, there are a lot no. of cultural issues that we haven't got to. You know, immigration right. is, a, is a useful symbol you know, of change, right. but right. it is not the only cultural change that is upsetting people. No, yeah. no, it is, no, it isn't. And that's why the answer but, may not only be to do with you know, immigration. But no, but I, yeah, but I do think that some of this- Controlling immigration won't right. fix this deeper anxiety. Well, I, I think controlling immigration plus having a different narrative around assimilation and national identity, I think actually is the, probably the best way, but we can have that conversation. But I think that um, the social liberal conservative issues around religion and uh, you know, even you know, a lot of those social liberal issues, marriage, divorce, et cetera, are not, they don't have that same political salient. They're actually declining with the decline of religion, I mean, religiosity being de in, in a decline in Europe and, and in the United States, at least for now, although ultimately, obviously, I don't think that'll be the long-term trend. But so I think the kind of ethnocultural type issues are rising in salience, whereas the kind of religio-cultural ones seems to me, at least in the West, not in Poland, I admit, um, but in, at least in the West seem to be lower. Um, but that doesn't, it's not to say that it couldn't come back, but I just think with high levels of immigration, that is what's gonna be the conversation. Unless you can completely control the media to completely shut down people raising that issue, I just don't see how that cannot be a central issue with high levels. And it's just the psychology of the last couple of decades, but I know Matthew Goodwin, who was referenced earlier, and is, does this mm. Faith Angle podcast, he talks about distrust of elites, uh, relative deprivation, uh, um, a fear of destruction, and, and, and de-alignment. And polarization, which has created this distrust of institutions. Right. You know, if, you, if, you know, if you think the, the government is all lying and the courts are full of you know, phonies, and ever, you know, then, you know, then you don't, you know, that, that, that may or may not have anything to do with immigration, and most likely not, but anyway. Let's go to uh, Baroness Philippa Stroud. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments as well. Um, just a couple of, of comments from me. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the UK is that the places in the UK that are the most multiracial actually have the highest level of tolerance of um, di different ethnic groups. So we have a, a town called Slough, which is not far from Heathrow um, in the UK. And um, it's almost 50% now multiracial. But actually, it was very, very happy being that way until the public services um, were cut. And then when there was strain on education, the school places, and when there was strain on health uh, provision, um, then the settlement began to shift, uh, which was really interesting. And then for non-multiracial areas, it's um, much more of a cultural one. We've mentioned the, the cultural references um, this morning. So it's um, much more along the lines of trying to protect a UK um, that um, people think existed, a kind of Judeo-Christian heritage that they are nervous that we are in the process of losing. And um, uh, we have not told our story as an island well to the people of, of the UK. So where we have um, migrant populations that um, have actually contributed significantly, we have um, omitted to tell that story. So um, uh, post the world wars, we had migrant groups who came to help us rebuild the UK. That is a story that is almost forgotten in the United Kingdom now. We have, we have not told that uh, story at all. But one thing I want to challenge from um, Eric is saying that the Brexit vote um, was about um, immigration. And we did a significant piece of work um, after uh, Brexit called 4852, Healing a Divided Nation. And we went through all the numbers in um, real detail. And we also did um, some recordings, some voice recordings as to um, and then some kind of word analysis of what people were actually telling Philippa, us. Philippa, was we the legatum or was we the, the it, state? It was legatum and the CSJ actually at the time, at, at that time, yeah. And um, 
we, uh, what we did was we, we analyzed, uh, the analysis showed that it wasn't so much immigration as the impact of uncontrolled immigration. And when people were, uh, were asked about what was driving it, they, their responses were almost universally pressure on housing, jobs, education, and health. And um, that actually, uh, we had just, obviously you'd had the, the recession um, followed by, um, in the UK, uh, a long period of austerity where we were taking money out of the public services. And the combination of these two things led to some pretty um, high-pressured situations in many of the communities around, around the UK. You play immigration into that, and it becomes quite, quite toxic. So I think it's just an interesting um, dynamic sitting behind all of that. And then just one thing I would say on the faith angle is that it's actually the migrant population that is growing the church in the UK. Um, so actually, it's the Nigerian churches in London. So, so London is the one place where the church is growing again um, and growing quite fast. And it's actually the Polish Catholics and uh, Nigerians who are really, really revitalizing the, the church in, in London, um, which is just an interesting phenomenon in the context of the faith angle. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true, by the way. Um, London, because it is a high immigration city, has seen its religiosity level stable, yeah. while it's dropped 40% in the rest of England and Wales in the last 30 years. So absolutely, immigration is, is definitely uh, helping religion, including Christianity. Um, but, but just on that question of, so Jonathan Haidt has this idea of, of, of the elephant and the rider, I mean, as a model of, of human behavior where the elephant is kind of what's driving you unconsciously and the rider is sort of, more or less a storyteller telling you, you know, why you're doing things. But actually, you may not necessarily be aware of, of why you are doing things. And I think one of the issues where you're asking people why they voted for Brexit, one of the issues that comes up, I think, is that it's not clear necessarily that they're, so if they say it's about pressure on services, is that really what it is? Now, it may be. I'm not saying it isn't. But it may well be that's more acceptable. So. If you ask Brexit voters, um, you know, how big a problem is pre pressure on services, pressure on public services, uh, zero being not at all, 100 being a big problem, you get about a 47, 48 out of 100. Um, you just, but if you say yeah. on your job, that's very different. If you say right. on your child's school place, that's very different. Right. If you say on your health surgery, it's right. different. So obviously, if you say public services, you're going to get a bland response. Right. But if you go directly to, which is why I think, you know, when Anne says, if you talk to them about health, you move them onto different territory. It's interesting right. to me. But you, but you just have to drop two words in, immigrants putting pressure on public service. So instead of how big a problem is pressure on public services, how big a problem is immigrants putting pressure on public services? And it jumps to like 70 out of 100 from 48. Um, now, <laughs> so, <laughs> now obviously, <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you're right. I'm not disagreeing with the reality, but the question is, therefore, what is it about you, the mentioning of this term immigrant? Does it suddenly change? You know, there's no way the problem that's caused by immigrants can be larger than the problem, right, of pressure on public services. So this is why, again, I, I don't think that's necessarily the driver. And if you look at the data, I mean, 40% of Brexit voters, immigration was their top issue. And the economic issues are like 5% or less. Um, it's just not showing up in the survey data, which I think is able to get behind. So the co if the correlation between your... So are you yeah. okay if I come back on yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, the, the, top, the top issue that voters voted for in Brexit, as Brexiteers, was taking back control of rules and And, and, and what is law. taking back control about? I mean, taking yeah, back but it was about the rules big, and the yeah. law as well. Yeah. So it's just... It, just in terms okay. of and no, and no, and the amusing thing, of course, is almost none of it has anything to do with Europe. Yeah. That's like a, you know the whole Brexit yeah. vote had almost mm -hmm. nothing to do with actually the European Union or what it does in the United Kingdom. Yeah. It That's was true. And the reason why the Brexit campaign was so successful was because it appealed to this deeper idea: you're losing control. control. Okay, mm -hmm. you're losing control of your borders, of your identity. You're losing your um, you're losing your 
ability to make decisions. You know, again, this other people in China are making decisions about your factory. Some people in Washington are making decisions that will make you lose a job. We can take back control. And it was a lie, of course, because it's not going to work. But that was the that was the deeper appeal. With that, we should turn to Europe a little bit more directly with uh, Catherine first and Pascal second. So before I went to Berlin, I actually was a correspondent in London, and I recall this one conversation I had on Romford Market in Essex, not far from London. It's sort of an 800-year-old market, and I was speaking to this butcher called Sticky. And Sticky had <laughs> British flags all over his little cabin where he was selling this brilliant British meat, and it was all about taking back control. He had written on the side. He was obviously a Brexit voter. It was sort of marketed, and I went up to him and interviewed him. And for the first 10 minutes of our conversation, uh, you know, I asked him, why did you vote for Brexit? He, he was basically uh, quoting Nigel Farage back at me. It was all about, I want to get my country back. I don't recognize my neighborhood. Take back control. It was these slogans almost verbatim from that conversation. And then we sat down in a cafe afterwards, and we talked for an hour and a half. So you know, those first 10 minutes literally was Nigel Farage pure. And then he was talking about his daughter's primary school, where the students basically had fewer substitute teachers where she would come home because there wasn't enough you know, provision. The library had been shut down because there wasn't enough money. The neighbor had been evicted because basically the, you know, the rent had gone up and she's now in some hotel with her, um, with her, with her daughter. Um, her, his wife was on some waiting list with the NHS, number nine in a queue for some operation. So it was austerity that he was talking about. And that, those were his own words. They were not the words that you would find in the media. So this is back to the salience issue, which is incredibly powerful. When I report now in Eastern Germany, it is exactly the same. When you spend 10 or 15 minutes talking to people, you will get the slogans. You will get almost exactly the slogan. And they all, they're exactly the same. It's incredible. You go from Brandenburg to Saxony, and they will give you the same sentences. It's an incredibly powerful campaign. But then you sit down with them and they will tell you that, you know, in this village where there used to be a post office and a doctor and a school and a bus stop that, you know, had services running every other hour, there's now nothing. So this makes me think two things. First of all, leader, political leadership really does matter. And I think pushing back on issues and I think, you know, affecting that salience is really important. So you can co-opt the far right's agenda and actually legitimize them and push the salience or you can change the conversation and go to the issues that people actually worry about. But that requires some deep listening on the part of politicians. Now, the other thing that, I, that struck me and I think might be interesting is um, everybody says that economics is relatively less important. I mean, when we talk about economic factors, I think, again, it's very vague. And again, there, I think there's a real conversation and a theoretical one as well. Often when I'm in AFD land in, you know, Eastern Brandenburg, um, you've got people who own their own house, who might have one or two cars outside their door. They will have a job. They're doing okay. But they're still deeply worried about economics. And they're deeply worried about the fact that their village has been cut off because there are no train services and public services, which is also an economic factor. These regional inequalities, I think, are hugely important. And there was recently a study by Marcel Fratcher in Germany at the IWF, which actually did uh, correlate AFD vote very clearly to regional inequalities. That's definitely economic. Very final point, in my experience, the areas that vote AFD on immigration grounds often, because that is the first 10 minutes of the conversation, um, are often the areas that have experienced the greatest emigration. So it's, it's not only that they don't have immigration, they have had a huge amount of emigration. And that is threatening, because the people who leave are the young people, the capable people. They are the lifeblood of that region. And I think this is probably, in part, the story of Eastern Europe, too, where you have countries like Bulgaria who shed, I mean, a huge percentage of their population just leaving. So again, that would be an interesting thing to look at, emigration correlating with anti-immigrant sentiment. And this is one of the things that I think is, I mean, the, the, very often it's demographic change um, not just about immigration, but about, as you say, um, loss of people. This regional argument also works to a certain extent in, in Eastern Europe. And the, so again, the, the oddity of this unbelievable success of Poland, which is by any measure you want to use, richer than it was, everybody's better off, lower class, middle class, upper class, roads are better, everything's better. So how do you get this idea that the, you know, and the answer, part of the answer is that younger people in particular 
don't compare themselves anymore to their parents' generation. They compare themselves to their contemporaries in Germany. You know, and Germany's still richer. How come the Germans earn whatever it is, 20 Deutschmarks and I'm not sorry, Deutschmarks? It's, 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 <laughs> oh, 20, <laughs> I was trying, what's the German currency? Uh, <laughs> 20 euros an hour, is, and we only earn 10 zlotties, you know, and, and so often it's this regional, the, there's, an, there's an unfairness, why are we so far behind, you know, that often this is, this is an, an, you know, this creates an anxiety or a sense of cultural loss. We're not competing with, with the rest of the world. I'll just say something quick. But, yeah, quick. I'll Sorry. be quick. I'll be quick just to say that I think regional geographic analyses are very flawed for a number of reasons. One is that the proportion of variation in voting or immigration attitudes that's accounted for by regional differences is generally low. Um, and also, so many things aren't controlled for in these regional studies. So are you controlling for the percentage of, you know, you can look at an area that has low percentage minority voting higher for the AFD, right? But what do we know about the educational level of that community? Um, what do we know about the age composition? You have to actually have all of these things, and you have to compare it with a cultural explanation, for example, based not on the percentage of immigrants, which actually might lead you to be more anti-populist, because those people don't vote populist, but you actually have to know about immigration attitudes. And I guess I would want to see a study using individual level data showing me the economic, any economic variable really matters significantly. No, they may have small effects, but, uh, but I haven't seen that. And I think that looking, just making these regional generalizations, I think is very problematic. And what people aren't going to tell you necessarily um, what, you know, why they're being motivated. I've seen focus groups where some woman will say, oh, I was on the train in Croydon outside London and I didn't hear anyone speaking English and that was terrible. And then someone in the focus group says, you know, you can't possibly, you know, if she, someone puts pressure on her and then she changes her story to, oh, well, no, no, I'm worried about my grandkids not getting a job, which is the more, I mean, I just think we have to be a bit more, you know, and, and with, you know, with the Remain campaign, they, they went hard on this. They said, you know, they were told, if anyone mentions immigration, change the conversation. And I, I think the Project Fear thing actually worked. First of all, it was a good move to, to scare people on, on economics, but it wasn't enough. So, and it's the same with the Democrats. I mean, you can't, to say, just don't have an answer on immigration, change this, the topic. I just don't think that's convincing, but... That's just my just a brief comeback. I think yeah. the big problem on the economic front, I mean, we've been talking about leadership on the sort of immigration front and how, why aren't Democrats or, or you know, center left mm. parties better at that. I actually think we haven't seen enough good and strong and innovative and new leadership on the economic issues. That's been part of the problem. So if you do project fear based on just GDP, I mean, I remember this, this one session in the UK, you've probably seen you know, uh, accounts of it too, where this, this economist from the government was like, don't vote Brexit because you know, GDP is going to go down. And in the back, someone hackled, that's your GDP, mate, not mine. So you know, it doesn't work if you feel that the system is rigged against you anyway. So you kind of need to come up with solutions to some of these problems that inspire anxieties, like automation like regional inequalities, you know, like, you know, redistribution, taxes. So I don't think we've seen real leadership on the economic issues, which makes it hard to say, well, people don't respond to the yeah, economic issues. And a narrative about those issues that gives people some sense of, again, feeling in control again. Or there's, there's someone who cares about you in this vast world of globalization and in this cacophony of noise that you hear all around you, there's a, there's a, there's a clear narrative. So it's partly, it's partly about that. I agree with that. Okay, so just tipping slightly toward journalists first and scholars to follow. We've got Pascal, uh, Gofredo, Susan Glaster, Chatty, Kathleen, Oz, Mika. So let's go to Pascal and go over. Um, thank you. Um, there was a, can you hear me? You bet. Um, there was a New Yorker cartoon that went viral after the election of Trump, I think, Probably most of you have seen it. It's a bunch of passengers on an airplane, and one of them stands up and says, I'm tired of those elitist pilots <laughs> flying the plane. Who's with me? Let's take over the cabin. And a friend of mine commented saying, if the pilot is flying the plane into the side of the mountain, that's actually the right behavior. Um, so in, in the early 70s, a, a French intellectual named Emmanuel Todd wrote a book called The Fall, and he predicted with utter confidence that the Soviet Union would collapse by the year 2000. And you can imagine that in 1970s intellectual France, that was a bit of a shock. People were arguing about when capitalism would collapse under the weight of its own contradictions. Um, and he looked at the 
biggest macro figures of the Soviet Union because he figured those were the hardest to fake. And so what he saw was um, declining life expectancy, declining birth rates, skyrocketing substance abuse. And he noted that historically, in any society where you observe these traits, you have political and societal collapse within a generation. And so that's how he made his prediction. Um, and you know where I'm going with this, which is that in Western Europe and the United States today, you have declining life expectancy, declining birth rates, skyrocketing rates of substance abuse. Um, there's a little Soviet joke. Uh, Stalin and Brezhnev are on a train. The train stops. Stalin, press gangs, passengers, makes them fix the train, shoots them. The train starts again. Train stops. Brezhnev has some people from the KG, mandates that everybody close the curtains and have some people go outside the train, wiggle it a little bit while going and so, you know, I, I want to suggest the possibility that we might be in a sort of Brezhnev era where we're sort of pretending that the train is still going, but it's not going anymore. Um, you know, there's this thesis called the Great Stagnation, which is uh, promoted by the economist Tyler Cohen and others. Uh, productivity has been stagnant since uh, the early 70s. And on, a look, and on a host of indicators, you can, you can show that technological progress has either stopped or slowed, except in digital technology. Um, and the problem with that is that uh, the institutions across the West have what the writer Eric Weinstein called egos, embedded growth obligations. So our social systems are premised on the idea that you're going to have more people tomorrow to pay services for people today, which isn't true. Um, you know, from the society to, if you have a law firm and you're hiring 10 young lawyers, you're hiring them on the promise that they can become partners. And so you have an embedded growth obligation. And so what happens if you're running an institution that has an embedded growth obligation and the growth stops? Well, one, one option is to be honest about that and try to figure out what's happening. Another option is to engage in fraud. Um, and so people have been trying to recreate growth because outputs are not growing. The way, the way to increase uh, the margins is to reduce inputs. So we've had massive shocks to the labor supply with, through immigration, through trade, through the entrance of women to the workforce. Um, we have created, you know, financial engineering was used to create lots and lots of fake growth. Uh, another problem you have when you have embedded growth obligation is that you need to reduce the scope of democracy because democracy works only in a positive environment where people can sort of bargain with each other about the pie. Uh, but that doesn't work in a zero-sum world. So we've witnessed a <laughs> shift of power away from democratic institutions to unaccountable institutions where there are you know, international institutions such as the EU, civil service, judges, media, um, and, and basically, you have to, in, to, to engage in, in gaslighting about what's going on. And so you have to explain to people that they have to make sacrifices because the robots are taking everybody's jobs, even though if you look at the productivity statistics, the robots are taking no jobs. Um, and on and on down the list. Um, and so we've been talking about the, the psychology of the populist voter. There's this a very famous study about the authoritarian mindset. And so it's defined about people who care about family, home, religion, uh, patriotism, quote unquote, law and, law and order, as opposed to lawlessness and disorder, I guess. Um, and so it's like, what is this authoritarian mindset? And maybe a useful frame is to look at what, how, how, would, you, how would you describe somebody who doesn't have that mindset, somebody who doesn't care about family, doesn't care about their country, doesn't care about rule of law. I think one word you would to use to describe such a person is a sociopath. Um, and so one, you know, one interpretation of the populist movement is that a, a large segment and an increasingly large segment of decision-making elites across the West and fields, whether it's politics, culture, um, business, have engaged in sociopathic behavior increasingly, and that's why other people are angry about it. 
good. We can probably let that hang. You know, <laughs> I would just there. say this. Uh, so, Karen, <laughs> the, the, the authoritarian studies that we're talking about, which I actually shared David Brooks's, you know, some doubt about whether you know whether it applies everywhere and so on. But the the the, the, ver, the she's not saying that some people like family and some people don't like family and some people like the nation and some people don't like the nation. It's about deeper thing. It's about there, she, she posits that there's a group of people who prefer unity, homogeneity. They don't like hearing different views. You know, they don't, they don't want, um, and then there's another group of people who she describes as libertarian thinkers or, liber, or, you know, who do like new experiences, who like meeting new people. It's much more, you know, they might be, they can be patriotic and love their families, but they also like going on holidays to different places every year. That was why you, that, right, you had right, that question right. in your thing. So it's just, it's, it's not a, it's not that we're talking about people who love their country and people who don't. We're talking about people who have a sort of different way of interacting with the world. That's that's the argument. So I don't think it's that sociopaths versus non-sociopaths. Just, just very quickly, I just definitely agree with that. I think that there's these things are relative tendencies. So I think Heights got a paper, a recent paper that shows that you know people with that dis more authoritarian order-seeking disposition are more likely to value friends or family over friends and the more liberal mindset is more friend-oriented rather than family. But it doesn't mean that the liberals are not also family-oriented. And the other thing also is that there's different types of national attachments. So I'd say the liberal type has a more, they might be more of a kind of missionary nationalist where the national identity is defined on, on ethical values or something. It's still a, a patriotism, but it's a different type. Yeah, I mean, look, there, there are different kinds of, you know, yeah. France classically has these two forms of patriotism that have been arguing with each other since the time of the Dreyfus trial, you know, where there's, <laughs> There's a version which is based on an ethnic definition of Frenchness, and then there's a version that's based on a sort of neutral idea of rule of law and justice and so on. And they both have their attractions, and they both have their their you know things people don't like about them. So you know, um, but that doesn't mean that you know no, Macron's not patriotic. Well, maybe you disagree with me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is he I'd say let's. I mean, we, <laughs> Of course, actually, yes. No, just kidding. Uh, you know, there's a deep, deep, deep read readership of, of both. I think let's jump to uh, Goffredo Boccini, uh, who is the author of Getty, uh, and has been writing about these themes as well from, from Italy. OK, thank you all. I have a question for Anne, which is uh, also an answer, because you called us by name, basically, in your previous uh, speech. Uh, you told that in 2018, in Italy, um, the figures of migration were going down, which is true, of course. And the news is, is also in 2019, because we had uh, just no more than 10,000 migrants in 2019. But you say that uh, the, the, the coverage of media uh, went in the opposite way, which is true, apparently. Apparently because there is an untold part of a problem. Uh, we have two kinds of problems. Um, a huge problem of re reception system. In Italy, the reception system of migrants is failed, basically. Mm. We have a, a, like a system in which a cooperatives, a, um, the private society, get advantage on migrants. And migrants are often abandoned in the street to their fate. Illegals are handed a leaflet in which is written a laughable recommendation. You have to leave the country in seven days. You can imagine how many people go out. And uh, we have another problem. We have 600,000 uh, illegals is the previous stock of migrants in the previous years. And uh, they are spread all around in our peripheries. So. Migration is still a huge problem for Italians, even if you don't see that because you just read the figures of the last two years. And the question is, uh, and I want to uh, even remember that in 2016, Europe closed the borders around Italy and refused any kind of relocation. So the question is, Thanks, how big is the responsibility of Europe on that? Thanks. No, I mean, I mean, so first of all, yes, I think Europe is, um, you know, you know, Europe did make the wrong response. Um, uh, I mean, 
you know, it's one of the amusing things about the Italian far right and the Hungarian far right and the Polish far right is that you know, one of the things that gave Orban some energy was this idea that there would be immigrants relocated to Hungary, even though it never happened. And one of the things that's given Salvini some energy is the fact that the immigrants weren't relocated. In other words, one of the things that divides the far right movements is they have completely different ideas of what um, Europe should do. I mean, my view. Of, I mean, my view is that first of all, Europe doesn't didn't get enough credit for what it did do. Namely, well, what Merkel did, which is she went and negotiated with Turkey to stop the release of migrants. I mean, and 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 your Italian minister who went to Libya and did exactly the same thing. So so the so some of the what has been actually effective has been going to the source of migration and doing a deal. And what would be really effective would be if Europe had an actual foreign policy and if it was actually active in Syria or active in Libya um, in ways that could help people's lives and you know, fix the deeper problems. I mean, that's a kind of longer. And if, if, you know, if, if I were Europe, that's what I would do. But <laughs> sad, sad, sadly, I'm not. I mean, I, I agree with your, your point also. I mean, obviously, the immigration I, I'm, I'm kind of walk a weird line where I, I think immigration is is a real issue, but it's um, but it can be played up and exaggerated because it plays into all these other things. In other words, it's become this talisman issue because it is an, it echoes for people these deeper problems. You know, we're losing our traditional way of being. We're losing our you know modernity is you know, and there's an economic version of that. There's a kind of religious cultural version of that. I mean, I actually think the decline of religion that you described is a huge source of anxiety for people. I mean, the decline of religion contributes, again, to the sense that whatever it was that made us Italian, you know, one of the things was the Catholic Church, right? And people don't go to church anymore. And so people, even if they're not religious themselves, I mean, you can feel this some kind of civilization change. And that creates the anxiety. And some of the anxiety is then focused on immigrants. So I, you know, all I wanted to say is there's some disconnect between the way immigration is written about and 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 how re, you know and the real questions and the real issues and the and the way it becomes the focus for anxiety that are, is also about other things. Mm -hmm. Sorry if that's I keep sorry that's a little convoluted. That's great, and I wonder, Kathleen, as a preview. I mean, we're going to talk about this this afternoon in in, in in depth, but if there's a brief clarifying sort of dynamic on 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 that, otherwise we'll go to Susan Glasser. Uh, I just, uh, one, uh, thank you. Just had uh, one reaction to um, to Eric's presentation was, uh, and it it um, sort of feeds back to Anne's portrayal of this, which I strongly agree with as a sort of uh, a useful issue, almost a manufactured issue as a proxy for other things. And uh, I was looking at at the at the chart that you had um, about uh, is. Uh, is ethnic group solidarity uh, racism? And um, you ha it framed the question as, is this person acting in her racial self-interest? And I'm thinking, is that a thing? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Do I have a racial self-interest as a white person? I, I don't feel that. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting uh, later in one of your remarks, you said a minority, uh, members of minorities feel that sort of ethnic self-interest more strongly than many white people do. And there's obviously good reason for that because they've been discriminated against, victimized because of their uh, minority identity. And so obviously they would have a sense of minority self-interest. But is, um, I mean, I guess my question is, where does this sense of racial self-interest of an overwhelmingly dominant group come from? To me, it's something that is manufactured uh, for political reasons. Right. Well, it's a good question. And, and I, OK, so um, if you ask, say, Americans, I've just done some survey stuff on this. You know, which Americans, ha which white Americans identify with their whiteness, or, or, or for whom is white identity important? Right. Um, turns out that people for whom being German or Italian or Irish or any of these ethnic or ancestry groups, if you're attached to that, 
then you are much, much, much more likely to be attached to being white. And that works for minorities, too. If you're attached to being Ecuadorian or Puerto Rican, you're much, much, much more likely to be attached to being Hispanic. So I actually think that, if, of course, it's not the whole thing. Whites are less attached. You know, even whites who are attached to their ancestry group, only about six and you know, six and ten of them have a, a, a white, a meaningful white identity compared to about eight in ten for Hispanics. So there is a gap, but the pattern is very similar. That the attachment is primarily first to ancestry, and then as a sort of second order. Uh, almost super, super ethnic identity, you have the kind of raci racial identity, which is kind of a euphemism for a pan-ethnic identity. So I don't think this is really about domination or oppression. I mean, that's part of the story. I'm not saying it isn't. But I don't think that's the main motivation for people who have, say, a white identity or a Hispanic identity, for that matter. Um, and, and I realize that's somewhat controversial. But I mean, so for example, if we take this question, and I, and we, I change this white American to Hispanic American, who identifies with a group in its history supports a proposal to increase immigration from Latin America to boost their group's share of America's population. So everything else about the statement is, remains the same, but we've changed white to Hispanic. And then instead of reduce immigration, we're going to increase immigration to not maintain but boost my group's share of the population. Suddenly, the response, say, from white Clinton voters goes from 73% saying that's racist, drops to 18%. And then for Trump voters, it rises from 11 to about 40. The point here is that the question is really around when is defense of groups' demo ethno-demographic interest, the interest in having a larger share or maintaining your share, is that, you know, that's a tribalism, absolutely. And the question is whether that is racism, or is it tribalism, which is not racism? And this gets to this point about, is attachment to own group racist, or is it just about dislike of outgroup? And, and I think that's an important distinction, because again, in the US data, people who are more attached to being white are not more hostile to blacks and Hispanics. So I think that's a distinction we're going to have to make. And I actually think it's not the case that we can just say majorities who are attached to their own group or even maintaining their demographic position are automatically racist. I think that's, a, that's actually a problematic interpretation. Which, and it's not what I'm saying at all. No, I know. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, minority groups that have been discriminated against have a practical uh, motivation for increasing the, uh, the weight, the political weight of their group, which often comes with demography. Um, but the, uh, the anxiety, the, the racial self-interest of a, a dominant group that is not discriminated against, um, I can see you know, that there are members of it who have good reason for status anxiety, job loss, and, and um, not the prospect of not being in the majority any longer. Uh, but the, uh, the question is, I guess in my mind, is you know, the, the political salience of each of those positions. You know, are, are you anxious about your status because you are discriminated against? Right, but I guess very quickly, I, I, I think a lot of this is not status and power. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's not an issue at all, but really to interpret these things through, strictly through the lens of power and status is, I think, a mistake. I think attachment to family, ancestry, cultural symbols, that, that, that it's that sort of cultural attachment, not wanting to lose what you know that is the driver. That's what I would say is the predominant driver and not some sort of desire for domination or status or whatever. But that would be my interpretation. Susan Glasser, The New Yorker. Well, thank you. This, is, this has really been a stimulating and terrific discussion. I, I will exercise my prerogative as a journalist and go a little bit from the abstract to the slightly more concrete. Um, first of all, just a sort of quick question for both of you, uh, but feel free to uh, demur. But I think we'd all love to have a little bit of a sense of your um, you know, sort of crystal ball gazing when it comes to, you know, where you see the story of this authoritarian populism going, uh, you know, in the in the next set of elections, and uh, you know, is there in fact a, a coherent narrative emerging, uh, you know, where uh, whether it's 
center-right parties or more traditional parties have, have found uh, the antidote uh, to outsider insurgents or not. Uh, so just quickly interested in any, you know, sort of future gazing you can want to offer us. And then just quickly, I do want to return to where it seems like most of the conversation is going back to, which is this question about whether the group really accepts uh, the notion that immigration uh, is what has been fueling this uh, electoral change or not. Uh, and I, I, I do want to push back and ask you, Eric, a little bit more concretely uh, uh, about your analysis of Trump and immigration in the United States. First of all, I, it seems to me that a lot of this, this data does not, goes up to 2016, but it does not uh, encompass the 2018 election, where you really did have a situation where President Trump seemed to define not only the Democratic narrative about immigration uh, and its role in fueling this uh, voting, but also his own party. Uh, he disregarded the views of Republican uh, party leaders who wanted to talk about the economy, who wanted to talk about the tax cut. and almost single-handedly uh, attempted from September t through the voting in November to make it a story about immigration, including uh, telling Americans that we were under invasion uh, by a caravan of uh, women and, and children, largely, uh, that was thousands of miles away from uh, most American voters. This did not seem to be very successful uh, as a campaigning tactic in 2018. And I'm wondering how that does or does not undercut the idea. The president clearly believes that immigration is, is at the heart of his political appeal. I think that the question and the debate that's emerged today is whether that's simply uh, a debate that he himself is sort of activated and is really a proxy for other issues. It, it seems to me, but I may be misinterpreting it, that your analysis today has accepted President Trump's frame. Uh, that you accept fundamentally the idea that he's right when he says that uh, uh, Americans are voting for him because they don't want immigration, regardless of uh, the facts about the numbers or the impact on our uh, communities. So I want to ask if that's if that's the case, if you do accept President Trump's framing of it. And also, just again, this doesn't delve deep into it, and not that it should necessarily, but in, in 2016, there were only 70,000 Bolts ultimately that decided uh, President Trump's victory in the Electoral College. It's a unique system. It's, it makes it very hard to draw a connection between our popular <laughs> vote and you know what actually happened, and therefore it makes it very hard to analyze what 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 was decisive. But uh, it does seem that that largely this was the Republican vote in the United States. Uh, that it's not certainly some sea change uh, uh, in terms of a massive shift. You know, going from you know kind of a 50-50 country to you know 60% in the way that we used to have in a more competitive dynamic uh, system, but no longer do. So uh, it, I just wonder if you have an answer to the question of whether uh, those three states that proved Donald Trump's margin of victory, whether it was there that immigration, uh, in your view, was decisive or not. And, and, and if not, then you know there is this interesting question of why are we just accepting the president's rhetoric about this? Thank All right, you. 30 seconds. Make it one more. Wow, 30 seconds. Okay. Tough response. 30 seconds. Very quickly, uh, I think you have to look at the primary, where immigration opinion was the number one predictor of why Trump, or, or feelings towards Trump on a zero to 100 thermometer in the primary amongst Republican voters. That's key. Once he gets the, the Republican leadership, then he can marshal the resources of the Republican Party. But it's also the case there were a lot of people who switched from either being non-voters a significant number of Obama voters that were motivated by immigration. So if you're anti-immigration, but you were a non-voter or Obama voter, those are the kinds of people that switched over to Trump in 2016. 2018, uh, yeah, if you look at the saliency, again, what is the most important issue in America for Republicans? Immigration is now up to like where it was for Brexit voters, like almost 40%. Um, so just unprecedented, like this issue had 0% saying it was the most important issue from 19, the 1930s right up until like 1990. You know? So it's absolutely a massive shift in the base. Um, immigration is really important for them in the base. And that's, now you could say it's Trump or the right wing media that's flipped on this. And Fox was not on the immigration thing until about 2015. But yeah, so I, I would say. But do you, do you yeah. have any answers to that question? I mean, that's the key question. Do they care about immigration because Donald Trump and Fox News told them to care about immigration? Um, I think that's part of it. I, I think, but the other thing is there was a doubling. I mean, in terms of arrivals at the border, if you look at so 20, 
sort of 2018-19 versus 2017-18. There was a significant, it was a doubling. So it's, there is some real increase at the, it's not a manufactured yeah, but the, problem. Most immigrants aren't coming over the border. I mean, it's no, a, that's a really no. fake statistic to use. Numbers. Right, right. But I'm just saying it's not, there, it's not as though the, you right. Then you see that in Texas, where, I mean, you know, right. why would that be some national issue unless Fox and the president had made it one? Right. And, and the alt right was pushing it online. Sure, sure. I mean, I think that's true. But I also think that, um, you know, without, I mean, if the border was really quiet, I think it'd be much tougher for Trump to do what he's doing. I mean, but I don't there think, was a surge at the yeah. border in 2014 also, sure. which was controlled. And once it, you know, once it was demonstrated that this could be controlled, the salience of it went right down. And just well, like there was a surge of immigrants into Hungary in the 90s. Oh which had no political impact whatsoever. I would argue the 2014 surge was absolutely central for Trump's uh, primary win. I mean, if you look at the, the, sali if you look at the salience numbers on, on immigration amongst Republicans, they spike up in mid-2014 with the, the Central American uh, mothers and children issue. And they never go back down below 10%. And that, that's unprecedented in the series that I've looked at. So, the, the immigration just had a much higher salience from 2014. But why does it have salience? It well, has salience because some people are pushing it as an issue. And, yeah. yeah, but it also had salience. I mean, if you look at, yeah. Anyway, there, there, right. anyway, we right. can talk about this. So I, I want to maybe just ask if, uh, for the last uh, group of you who've been very patient, if you might just sort of uh, raise the issue you had in mind, and we can sort of let it hang as we, as we turn the corner. We probably won't get to everybody but Paulina, please. Yeah, I'm interested in the issue of uh, crime and immigration and the link between the two and uh, to what extent this is a driver of uh, populism, events like uh, the Cologne attacks or the terror wave in Europe. And let's get uh, Oz as well. I was intrigued that at the Faith Angle Forum there was no mention of religion at all I, in the I talks. I had a whole long paragraph about religion. <laughs> and I'd love to hear, particularly from Anne, because the both in Poland and Hungary, and in other countries, it's been so yeah. crucial. You see this as sort of an anchor, Mika. So I want to raise the faith angle also. I find your theory, and very interesting, because you're reversing the cause and effect. You're saying it's not that the immigration issue is triggering anxiety. It's the fact that we have anxiety, and some smart people are channeling our anxiety towards immigration. If it's not immigration, it will be the invasion of the LGBTQ community, like in Poland. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the issue is creating anxiety. It's the anxiety is searching for an issue. And by reversing that, you're saying, so the problem is in our minds, not in the world. And by locating the problem, which is, I think, the major disagreement between you and Eric, <laughs> I think there's an interesting disagreement here. In the Talmudic tradition, you always search for the silent disagreement. And I think there's a, a very interesting disagreement here on the table. We, I feel the need for some Talmudic yeah. wisdom here. <laughs> yes. Don't miss tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so if the problem, so, we, so then we, if the problem is anxiety, so let's ask a question, why is it such a coincidence that in North America and in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. And in the Philippines. And the Philippines and in Israel, there's so much anxiety that's searching India. for an issue. Why is there anxiety in the world? That's the deeper question. And maybe if the problem is anxiety not triggered by policy. So if the problem is not policy, so what's triggering anxiety? Now maybe this has to do with cultural questions, religious questions. David Brooks, I think, wrote a book about this. I mean, it's a part of your book, The Second Several Mountain. Books. That may be the fact that people are more lonely than they used to be. And that has to do with everything. This has everything to do with decline of religion, for example. When people are more lonely, they have more anxiety. And when they have more anxiety, so people could manipulate that anxiety and channel it towards different issues. So maybe the real, another, I don't want to say what the real conversation is, but taking your paradigm shift and seriously means we should be discussing not only policy issues, but the faith angle issues. I would not necessarily faith, but yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, we can call it faith, or we can call it identity, or we can yes. call it feeling yes. of belonging or something. I'm yes. just recognizing I that completely this is called faith angle. And let's get a final comment from Shadi. I mean. <laughs> So um, 
I'm a little bit torn about this, so I'll try to formulate it as best as I can. But in, in this conversation, so I, I worry that we kind of approach these issues around national populism or right-wing populism. And our goal in, in a, lot of, a lot of conferences that I've been in in the past, the goal is to think through how we can defeat right-wing populism. So we're, we're coming at it from a normative perspective where we have a specific goal of how can we defeat them, destroy them, or reduce their support. And I get that, and I'm somewhat sympathetic to it. Um, however, I worry that, so my role as an analyst or an observer or a writer, I don't think it's really my place to go into analytical conversations with a particular goal of reducing the support of a party in a country that I'm not a citizen of. So if we're talking about America, where I am American, um, I have strong feelings about anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobia that comes from Donald Trump and others in the Republican Party. And sometimes I speak personally as an American Muslim in that regard. But when I'm wearing more my analyst hat, um, which I do most of the time, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm quite uncomfortable. And I don't know what the alternative is, but I just wanted to flag that as a particular concern because, and this goes to the other, the, the other issue, and then I'll just kind of end there, which is how we describe these right-wing populists. And I'm very uncomfortable with the term authoritarian populist. Maybe in Hungary and Poland it works, but in Western Europe, I don't think it is the right term to use. I have seen very little evidence in any of these countries that they are in any real sense anti-democratic. Now, they, may, they are anti-liberal. They are mm -hmm. illiberal. And oftentimes, unfortunately, in Western discourse, when people say Democrat or Democratic, what they really mean is liberal, or they mean liberal Democratic. And I think we have to be very careful about essentially saying that these parties are trying to can't end democracy or subvert democracy if we don't actually have evidence to that effect. Now, there, it's, it may be a speculative argument about what might happen in the future, but I also worry about preemptive arguments that are about things that may happen that haven't happened yet. So in that respect, um, and there's also the argument that some of these parties actually are in some sense, I don't want to say more democratic, but Yasha Monk in his book, The People Versus Democracy, he draws a distinction between undemocratic liberals and illiberal Democrats. And he's making the point here that a lot of, a lot of liberal parties in the West have strong anti-democratic features. They're basically authori authoritarian technocrats to one degree or another. That's exaggerating it a little bit, but the idea of bureaucratic constraints on elected leaders is very much something that comes from the center left and from so-called liberal elites, where right-wing populist parties are saying that um, some of those bureaucratic or supranational constraints should be removed or lessened. You could argue that's actually more in the spirit of democratic participation and competition. And I think there's also, I, I, I'd, cu I'd be curious, we probably don't have time for it now, but I want to just put that out there as a kind of bigger framing issue that I think is actually a very key divide in these debates, is how do we fundamentally see these groups? Are they are they anti-democratic or are they important parts of a democratic process? We might not like them, they might have bad ideas, but if they are channeling the expression of a significant portion of the population, then that is something we have to respect and is very much in keeping with democratic principles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Might just briefly flag okay. that, please. Last remark. <laughs> oh, last remark, one hold, come on, yeah, yeah you bet. <laughs> Last word for, for the Eastern Europe. <laughs> uh, well, the must, my, 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 my last remark will be that uh, we haven't mentioned the Russian influence over the authoritarian, over the, well, all those illiberal movements uh, across Europe, across the world. Across the world. Uh, well, it's totally visible in Hungary, where the prime minister is now an asset, and so he works as an asset of Vladimir Putin, and the cooperation between Hungary and Russia. Uh, in spite of the belonging of Hungary to the European Union, is well, on all the level, all the levels are as high as as never. We have such uh, influence in Poland. We had such influence in, in Germany. Uh, well, the IFD 
politicians saying that the relation uh, with Russia must be restored to the level observed during the Bismarck regime, well, that's quite remarkable. Uh, this imperial thought in, in, in Germany. Uh, we had in a business connection uh, financing of, of uh, Front National in France, uh, financing of uh, Italian uh, populist parties. So, well, I, I would consider that uh, that, that illiberal, Ill, illiberal movement, uh, authoritarian movement, uh, populist movement in Europe as a kind of, you know, of a weakness, which the external enemy, Russia, probably later China or I know Erdogan would use against us. So it's kind of, you know, the breach in the system, uh, which could be, you know, in, infected and, and, and used to drive the, the wedge uh, and in order to make us, make us weaken. This, there's a both serious threat. Well, the Russian intelligence is this kind of, you know, super state structure, a highly intellectual, highly prepared. They got great analysis of all the processes which are taking pl place in Europe, and they, they know how to exploit. That's my remark. Thank you. Thank you, Bartos. Okay, great. So there, there was, for the organizers on this, um, an effort to try to say, uh, is there, is there a, a foundational reality, something very large happening in our world right now that is worth wrestling with? And uh, this idea of national populism is maybe a little bit like a multifaceted diamond. I mean, immigration is one piece of it. Maybe religion is a piece of it. There are lots of dynamics that are at play. Psychology is a piece of it. Uh, Russia is the larger struggle. But I think our, our, our interest on this, there was a, a line in Matthew Goodwin's book uh, from two Harvard sociologists who said, uh, Steve Levitsky and David Noletskep, it was haunting, I thought, that there's never been a, a successful transition in history when a majority ethnic group in a multiracial democracy or culture becomes a minority, ceding its power to a ma new majority. And essentially, that we ought to be uh, uh, <laughs> cognizant of that in the demographic changes that are ahead. And so this is an effort to, uh, to sort of introduce that as an anchor conversation for those that will follow.